We're recording, please go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, it's April 1st, 2024, and this is no joke, okay? Thank you, that's the last joke for the night. Uh, this is the regular meeting of the town council. The open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at a meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time by, by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 and live stream. In fact, there are 10 counselors in the town room at this time. I mentioned that specifically because I've gotten some comments that said, when are you going to go back in person? And we've actually been back in person since the beginning of January, 2023. Um, so uh, given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the April 1, 2024 regular town council meeting to order at 6.32. I'll call upon each counselor. Please unmute your mic, say present. That means we can hear you and you can hear us. And when we're done, make sure you mute your mic again. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Counselor Etta. Present. Lynn Griesmer's present. Counselor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Counselor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Councilor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. I'm here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. And Councilor Walker. Here. We are all present this evening. Um, there is no chat room for the meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. To make a comment, use the raised hand button. If technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing technology, Athena and I will decide how to address the situation, including the possibility of having to suspend the meeting until we get the technology working again. Um, there will be a gen one general public comment period at this meeting immediately following the announcements. The order of the agenda is the same as posted. Uh, I want to call attention to three meetings coming up. April 8th, again, one week from today, we have a regular town council meeting. April 25th, which is a Monday, at 6.30, we will have a public hearing on the regional school budget. That will be virtual. On April 29th, if needed, we will have a special town council meeting. Anyone wishing to speak? We're getting ready for general public comment. I'm gonna wait for the audience to enter. While they're doing that, if you're on Zoom and you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. I will, not to worry. Anyone wishing to speak who is in the town room, if you have not signed up, please do so with Athena O'Keefe at this time. At this time, I also would like to remind those people who have brought signs into the room. It is fine that you have signs, but you may not hold them up in a manner that obstructs other people's view. We're waiting for people to finish signing up for public comment for those of you that are not in the room.
Oh. Athena, how many people have signed up that are in the room? 14. 14, thank you. And uh, there are six people who have raised their hands that are on Zoom. Um, public comments are a matter within the jurisdiction of the town council. Residents are welcome to express their views. In this case, we're going to go for up to two minutes. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. The First Amendment broadly protects individual rights to address the government, to speak and to express themselves, including their rights to say hateful and unfortunately offensive things. I am generally unable to shut those commenters down under the First Amendment to the US Constitution unless their level of speech falls within an ex exception articulated by the courts, such as fighting words, true threats to a particular individual, harassment of a particular individual, or incitement of eminent lawless activity. If a question exists as to whether a particular speak in, speaker is engaging in unprotected speech, I must defer to the principles of freedom of speech. We'll recognize speakers in the order in which they have signed up, rotating uh, between Zoom and in person. Let's start with in person in the room. Did you say two minutes or three minutes? Two. Two, thank you. First is Deb Leonard, please come up. State your name and where you live before you begin your comment. Hi, uh, my name is Deb Leonard. I'm a resident of Amherst. I'd like to make it clear that I'm speaking tonight to share my own personal thoughts. I do not speak to represent any other committee or um, group of people I am part of. So um, I'm, I'm just gonna really try to st stick to I statements. Um, and I'm, I'm just looking for the opportunity to make informed decisions about the, uh, the policies and the budget that I'm facing as a voting member. So um, I don't, it's my third month on the job and I just have more questions than answers. Um, the, the, the budget that, um, the budget that we had initially considered voting um, had a lot of questions that I had that I didn't have the time to answer. So I just wanted to share some of my thoughts regarding those. I know I don't have a lot of time. Um, I'm just gonna run down the line. Um, I wanna know what the implications of cutting department head time, release time is in terms of our ability to support um, the various initiatives that the department heads do during that release time. I wanna know if 0.5 FTEs are hard to fill, how, how does that look in terms of filling fractional positions in the middle school? Well, that's about it. Um, I so, let me just make, Deb, please submit your comments to us in writing. You okay. can send it either to the town council through our general email address, which, which is towncouncil at amherstma.gov or through the general public comment. Okay. Okay. I, I guess in sum, I'm just asking for time to make proactive decisions rather than reactive ones. And I don't feel Thank you. I've been able to do that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to Zoom. Uh, the first person is Ian, or Ian, Rod Welt. I apologize for mispronouncing your name. I think I've done that before. Um, that's okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Uh, my name is Ian Rodewalt. I'm the organizer for the Western Mass Area Labor Federation, a coalition of more than 60 public and private sector unions, um, including the Amherst Pelham Education Association. Uh, I wanted to, for my remarks tonight, highlight two sentences from the Town Council's uh, June 13th, 2022 resolution in support of the Fair Share Amendment. And that is, whereas all children deserve equal access to a high quality, well-rounded and well-staffed public education with a rich and varied academic curriculum, ample opportunity to explore the arts and athletics and social emotional resources to support their overall well-being. And whereas school districts across the Commonwealth have uh, been forced to cut essential programs due to budget shortfalls resulting from years of inadequate levels of state funding for public schools. Um, so those are the, the two sentences I wanted to highlight from that resolution. Um, I urge the town council to advocate with the legislatures for any chapter 70 increases that may be needed to fully fund the school budget and fight for what is needed by APEA teachers uh, with the recognition that this may require an override. Please find the funds so that cuts are not made to uh, the budget and cuts are not made to uh, teachers. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Back to the audience, Athena. Amala Fahani. Please state your name and where you live before you begin your comment. Thank you. Um, yes, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Ahmad Espahani. I actually live in Greenfield. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, I'm here mainly for the minutes uh, to inform the town of uh, Amherst that uh, I'm seeking nomination signatures to run in the upcoming primary for District 2 uh, for the congressional, uh, congressional election as a Republican. And I just wanted to notify the town and it being the minutes. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Going back to um, Zoom, uh, Meg Gage, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi everyone, this is Meg Gage. I live at 208 Montague Road in North Amherst. Um, my comments are a little unusual now that I'm hearing what this meeting is about, but I'm here to uh, support the CPA proposal for the Mill River History Trail project. Um, it's an incredibly exciting community organizing project. We made really good use of the first CPA grant that we got two years ago, $12,900, and a 200-page report um, covering the four initial historical sites, the two Roberts Mills, the one uh, just west and one just east of the Francis Bridge, the Cushman Clam Club, which was a men's club that had a lot of exciting family dramas, we found out, and the Mill uh, Canal that went from it goes along the whole uh, north side of the park. There was a huge amount of industry that's gone on in North Amherst, but there was also a lot of indigenous activity. And we've discovered that um, an indigenous, probably Nipmuc Trail, a uh, tr major trading trail went right along pretty much where the river is. And we're reaching out to people from that um, community to help with this project. The current proposal is stage two, which will look at 15 additional sites. Um, and it will also launch greater outreach to the broader community website development and ad addition, as I said, outreach to targeted um, constituencies like high school students and so on. Some of the aspects of this stage are not sponsored by the historic preservation guidelines of the CPA. And to that, to support those activities like website design and community organizing, We've, we're doing additional fundraising. We've raised $10,000, of which $5,000 is a match, and toward that we've raised $1,000. So that additional $15,000 will help us um, with those activities. If anybody, anybody should be interested, let me know. Um, and also, if you'd like a copy of the report of the first research, I can email you the link. <clears throat> Most of these sites are on conservation land and we're working really closely with the conservation staff and actually have invited them to appoint someone to join our planning committee. Um, I'm going to skip some of what I had here. Sites not on the conservation land include the North Amherst Library, where there used to be the where the addition was just built, there used to be a blacksmith. And uh, Catherine Stryker noticed as they were digging the foundation, these horseshoes were coming up out of the dirt. And she pulled them out and through an agreement with the town and right builders, they've been saved and we're hoping to have a, an exhibit. My time is just about up. Um, 
there's a whole bunch of other sites, the factory housing on Thank Summer you. Street and so on. And Thank you, Meg. Okay, one last, can I say one sentence? This is in the spirit of community archeology, span which is about engaging the community, not just experts. Thank community you. Are better at preserving historical things than experts in government. Thank you. Bye. Thank Going you. Going back to the audience. Tom Irwin. My name is Tom Irwin. I live at 54 Central Ave in Dalton, Massachusetts. I appreciate this opportunity to com comment about the paint stewardship legislation presently before the House Ways and Means Committee. While a member of the Dalton Waste Management Recycling Committee, where we were facing the same daunting waste crisis that Amherst faces, rapidly increasing hauling costs and tipping fees, and we were looking for a solution. After a careful study of ways to address this issue, paint stewardship seemed like the perfect first step. And after confirming it was working well in the eyes of residents and retailers in Vermont, New York, and Connecticut, I became an advocate for this law. Paint Stewardship is a program where unwanted paint can be returned to any participating paint retail store or transfer station whenever they're open, without a disposal cost, and without regard to where the paint was purchased. The cost to consumers is simply 75 cents to a dollar fee per gallon of paint at the time of purchase. 80% of collected latex can be reprocessed to original specs and sold at 50% of the original cost relieving our waste burden. The benefits Amherst will see are first, that is gonna be a service Amherst residents will value. This is quickly apparent by noting that 92% of 735 mass residents dropping off items at household hazardous waste days events signed petition asking their legislator to become co-sponsors. This suggests that 92% of Amherst residents with unwanted paint, and likely there are many, would support this bill. And second, it will present no cost to municipalities and will decrease household hazardous waste day costs. Although 28 reps and 12 senators, including Representative Dom and Senator Comerford, sponsor or co-sponsor this bill, significant municipal support through resolutions is critical to compel serious consideration by the Ways and Means Committee to take this matter up, view it favorably, and send it to the floor of the legislature for a vote. Hence, I respectfully request the Amherst Town Council put paint stewardship on an upcoming agenda to make possible adding their valued endorsement of paint stewardship through passing a supportive resolution. Thank you Thank for you. your comments. You all have a hand. Thank you. Uh, we're going back to Zoom. Tony Cunningham, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Hi, this is Tony Cunningham, um, District 1. I am the parent of two children in the Amherst Public Schools, one in eighth grade at the middle school and one in fifth grade at Wildwood. I'm speaking in favor of the town funding the fiscal year 2025 budget that was recommended by the regional school committee. A large part of this ask is for costs that are out of the control of the school committee. For example, employee health insurance has increased by almost 10% this year, representing approximately $150,000 over and above the 4% allowance from the town. Utilities have gone up 22% since FY23, an increase of $126,000. Transportation cost too has increased significantly. Our children's education should not suffer to cover these types of cost increases. Our students' access to foreign language instruction in middle school should not be on the chopping block. Restorative justice programs should be preserved. Many of the proposed cuts would likely result in further enrollment decline in our school district, further exasperating budget challenges. The decision to dedicate 10.5% of property tax receipts to pay for capital projects is squeezing operating budgets and will have long-term lasting impacts on our school system. I would also note that the amount of additional funding being requested by the regional schools is similar to the amount you agreed to pay in interest on the temporary borrowings, the bond anticipation notes, to front the Jones Library share of the expansion project over and above the town share of the project. Please find the funds to cover these costs so we do not have to lose teachers to pay for it. We cannot afford to lose more students to charter and private schools. We need to remain competitive. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next, Athena. Amber Kendall Martin. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, my name is Amber Kendall Martin, and I'm an Amherst resident. I live in District 2. 
Um, I have two children in the Amherst Public Schools. Um, I'm here tonight, <clears throat> sorry, a little congested, um, to talk to you about the school budget. So a couple of weeks ago, the Regional School Committee um, restored about 15 positions, um, teaching positions to the regional school's budget that otherwise would have been lost um, based on the superintendent, so superintendent's uh, proposed budget. Um, so these cuts were gonna come from things like the World Language Program in the middle school, um, the restorative justice coordinator at the high school, someone who's really highly trusted and good at working with students and families, and um, really helps out some of the most vulnerable kids in our district. Um, paraeducators who, who help um, kids who have uh, special education needs. So we were basically cunning from some of the most vulnerable in order to balance the budget. Um, and I think it was clear to a lot of us there, to the union, to the parents, to everyone, um, that this budget proposal was totally unacceptable. Um, you can't run a school that way. You know, you can't take the money away from the, the people that are actually working with the students, right? Like the direct support staff that works with students is the absolute worst way to balance a budget. Um, and I'm so happy that the Regional School Committee did its job and went ahead and restored those teaching positions. Um, even though that leaves us with about $800,000 that we need to make up in the gap, um, I believe that it's worth it. And if we wanna live up to our values around education and the importance of public schools and public education, we need you all to find the funds to cover that gap. It's really, really important and crucial. People come to this town for the schools. I bought my house here for the schools. I'm sure many parents did. Um, and you guys do have the money. Like Tony mentioned the capital budget and, and how that's squeezing um, our operating budgets. This can't continue. I don't have children in the middle school yet, but I'm not sure what's gonna be left for them. We need you to. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Nina Minkin. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Nina Mankin, and uh, I live at 91 Summer Street in North Amherst. I have a child who's in sixth grade at Wildwood, and I'm also writing about or calling in, zooming in about um, about the, the budget. Our family has lived in Amherst for nearly six decades, and in that time, we've witnessed our school district go from one of the best in the state to its current state as average in the state, uh, a little above average. And I'm deeply grateful for all of your work. I know how hard it is to do this job. Um, most of you are volunteers and those in town who are also who are working in a paid capacity have to balance budgets, I understand this, but I, I question uh, the current ethos that I see in our community and that I also see in our country that thinks that average is acceptable um, and average is less and less impressive. And when I say that, I very much hope I'm not heard as talking about privileged people, but about all of our, our, our students, that excellence must be um, exhibited on all levels of our education system. And that that is our, uh, not only our, our value system, but our highest goal. So above all, I'm asking you not to accept the status quo um, I, and to move heaven and earth to show our children that we hold to a value of giving them everything that we can. Um, and I also ask you to look at the savings you're going to see, we're gonna see from these new schools um, in ways that other people have talked about the costs costing us now, and to bring some of those savings forward by tapping into our reserve funds. Thank you so much for all your time. Well, Thank you for your comments, Nina. Back to the room. Allegra Clark. Hi, my name is Allegra Clark. I'm a resident of District 2. I am a parent of a Wildwood student. And I'm a graduate of Amherst High School, and I graduated in 2003 when we were number two in the state. Um, so I have fond memories of the school. I also moved back here because of the school system. When my child was born, I knew that this was a great place to raise a family, so we came back here. Um, so I... I think this is the first time I've been in front of the town council asking to 
approve the budget that the regional school committee is putting forward to you because it's one that does not include devastating cuts. It in fact restores the cuts that were proposed. So I think that we need to be bold and brave and we need to find the funds. Um, I think there's reserves could be a possibility, especially if some of the planned um, energy savings at the new elementary school will come forward. Hopefully they could be replenished in some way. Um, I know there are ARPA funds and there was a presentation at the last town council meeting about how they are possibly going to be used. But I think that in terms of child mental health, that is a big byproduct of the pandemic and seeing the restorative justice coordinator positions be cut really would have a negative impact on students and their mental health. Um, if you look at the tape of the last school committee meeting, um, they there were some students that spoke about the importance of that program to them. Um, so I think that's important that the youth themselves have identified that as a really important thing in the school and, so, and a really important person to them in the school who's also an Amherst alum. So I think, I think that we have some possibilities for funding and we should take them because our students deserve Thank you. it. Thank you, Allegra. Uh, Deborah Ferreira, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Deborah Ferreira. I'm not gonna say my address because, you know, even though I'm all about First Amendment, but um, I've heard some of the hateful things that others have said in the past. Um, at these meetings, and so I'm very afraid to to say my address. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm I'm a co-chair on the Community Safety and Social Justice uh, Committee. But today, my the opinions are my own. I'm a parent. I have a um, a child in the middle school, and then my oldest son went through uh, the public school system. And as the other uh, folks who have already talked about the the the, the school system, um, you know, I want to also talk about that. I'm calling to ask that the town council fully fund fund the amount that our school committee is asking for in order to avoid the cuts to teaching positions. If the cuts go through, our most vulnerable students will be impacted, which include BIPOC students, special education students, um, students who need the mental health uh, support in our schools, our language programs, and many more marginalized student populations that these teachers serve. Um, I'm hoping that you all see the importance of this and, and won't let that happen. If the funding does not go through, one of the positions being proposed to be cut is the restorative justice position that is held by a black male teacher who is doing an excellent, and I say that again, excellent job, as well as it serves to educate our students with different ways to approach resolving problems as opposed to punishment. This position stems the adverse effects of discipline on BIPOC students. Hope you do the right thing like the school committee did because they heard us. And I hope you all hear us today and all subsequent days because we're going to continue to, to let you all know how much this is important and send a message to all our children that they matter. And second, I just want to urge the town manager to disperse the ARPA funds fairly by including a disbursement to the Black Business Association of Amherst area. Thank, Thank you. you for your comments. Thank you. Back Lam to the room. <clears throat> Lamiko McGee. Good evening. I'm here to support the uh, regional school committee and um, requesting that you um, put the money back into the school budget. When we look into the future 10 to 20 years from now, what do we want to see? Do we want highly educated residents, exceptional public schools, and a thriving community, beneficiaries of the education provided because we value our schools now? Or will another picture be painted? Plummeting property values, reduction in high school graduation, residents trying to get by, not, academic, not academically strong enough to attend university, not being able to get the skills they need to get to the next level? Will we see a floundering community suffering from the decisions that we make right now? Our future is in our youth. We must invest in them and they'll show a return to our community. 
The regional school strategic plan has committed the district also to greater diversity and dismantling white supremacy. We cannot continue this work without the, with the deep budget cuts. For our last hire, they will also be our first fired. And we know those are our educators of color, our staff of color. Do we value our students? If so, let's give them the education they deserve. I believe we are obligated to provide our students with an education, a well-rounded education. That means we keep world language, the arts, restorative practices, counseling, special education services, everything they need because we love them and want them to thrive. We want this community to thrive. These cuts won't heal easily. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, Pat Anabaku, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Good evening. Can people hear me? We can, Pat. My name is Pat Ananibako, District 2, uh, the chair for Black Business Association of MS Area. I am speaking on behalf of my group. So I was cruising the uh, our town website a couple of days ago. And um, how ironic that our town has launched kindness campaign, but our town manager, town council, finance committee have not shown kindness and empathy to my group, BBAA, regarding upper funds dis distribution. I want to remind the town manager regarding his conversation with Representative Jim McGovern in July of 2023. Rep McGovern made a phone call to our town manager at the request of my group members after he met with my group at my place of business in Hadley. And Rep McGovern got back to me and said that he has spoken to the town manager, urging him to allocate some of the upper funds to black business businesses. So I just want to say this publicly and it has not happened. We will keep, continue to advocate, even if it, it, it involves protests, we're not going anywhere. I want to conclude by supporting what everybody else has said about school budget. You can find the money, reduce police budget, use some of the upper funds. Please Thank conclude you. your comments. Ella Stalker. Hello. My name is Ella Stalker. I'm a resident of Northampton and I'm the librarian at Amherst Regional High School. Whatever comments I do not finish, my colleague Amy Coleman will pick up when she speaks next. Last month, the department heads, of which I am one, at Amherst Regional High School were asked to speak to the Regional School Committee about how budget cuts would impact current and future students at the high school. We are grateful for the advocacy of our school committee in passing a higher budget that would prevent these initially proposed cuts, but we want to make sure that you are aware of how those cuts would have impacted us or will impact us if you do not find the appropriate funds for our schools. These cuts impact our individual departments in specific ways, but all of our work is fundamentally interconnected. Collective cuts across departments diminish the culture and spirit of the school in ways that are hard to quantify, but no less essential. We know as experienced educators that these changes put students who struggle at greater risk, imperil our ability to provide enrichments for our most academically advanced students and widen the cracks for students who are on the bubble by removing effective interventions. Among the proposals put forward was the option to significantly reduce the overall amount of release time for department heads. This limits the amount of time available for writing and managing significant grants, managing staff and special programs, developing curriculum, all while increasing teaching loads. This also impacts other teachers because when teachers in, and department heads increase their teaching loads, other teachers are bumped into part-time positions. It is very difficult to retain the same level of experience and exceptional teachers for faculty 
who are qualified to teach full-time elsewhere, but can only get a part-time position in Amherst. Indeed, there are current open positions that have been open all year at the high school. Staffing reductions are also proposed in guidance at a time when student mental health and emotional needs have never been higher. The lower budget would also reduce, eliminate, or fundamentally alter successful interventions such as the restorative justice program or prep academy. These programs ensure that we can meet the needs of vulnerable students. History has shown us when we cut tier two interventions, increase class sizes, and reduce Please guidance. Conclude. I'll conclude right now. Um, these result in higher cost to the districts over time when students end up needing and qualifying for special ed. Thank you. Amy Coleman. Good evening, my name is Amy Kalman. I'm a speech language pathologist at the high school. I'm a parent of an alum of Amherst High and also a 10th grader. Um, and I forget if I mentioned, I live in Amherst. I've lived here for many years. Um, so let's begin. All departments are impacted by proposed cuts of two FTE positions in special education. I'm a speech language pathologist, so those are my students and my colleagues, as well as paraeducator positions, particularly through the reduction or elimination of COTAC courses. These courses pair a special education teacher with a general education teacher, enabling more students to access general education classes and inclusion. The loss of these courses when combined with larger class sizes will reduce the accessibility and availability of both introductory and advanced courses. There are also wholesale cuts to programs at the middle school that will dramatically imp impact how courses are sequenced and taught at the high school, most especially in performing arts, dance, and world language through the gutting of the middle school language and dance programs. The retirement of the computer science teacher at the high school will also illuminate computer science classes at the high school in this era. These cuts reduce the attractiveness and competitiveness of the town of Amherst against our peer communities and charter schools and limit our students' opportunities to express themselves and discover their passions. We retain students in our district from leaving for charter or private schools because of the depth and quality of our electives and the variety of offerings in our core curriculum. The cuts across elective departments in languages, core subject areas, in guidance or in in interventions, in co-teaching, in departmental leadership, all these are devastating on their own. Collectively, they are catastrophic. We love our students, our colleagues, and the communities we serve. It's exhausting that on top of doing our job year after year, we also have to fight for a budget that Please. we fully or even adequately provide them with the kind of schools they deserve. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your hard work. Sir. Thanks. Michelle Prindle, please. Good evening. I'm a resident of South Amherst. I have three children in the public schools. I have one child who is on the autism spectrum receiving special education services through our schools, and I'm here to ask you to approve the school budget. Today, I want to make clear to you the situation at the middle school. Our eldest child is an eighth grader at the Amherst Middle School. The current physical state of the middle school is unacceptable. Last fall, a high volume rainstorm caused ceiling tiles to collapse in six academic classrooms, rendering them unsafe for learning. Our son is a musician in the school's orchestra and choir. In January, on the eve of the eighth grade concert, another rainstorm caused water to accumulate above the ceiling of the auditorium. Black sludgy water filled flooded the auditorium from the ceiling and from beneath the stage. The students who had remained after school for pizza and a pre-concert rehearsal found themselves assisting school custodians in mopping the disgusting black water from the floors before guests could enter the auditorium. On March 23rd, our two younger children performed in Lion King Jr. with Starlight's Youth Theater. An ice and rainstorm overnight and on the morning of the 23rd again caused flooding and water to rain down from the ceiling of the auditorium during both performances. My parents and the in-laws from Connecticut were in attendance and they were shocked at the condition of our middle school auditorium. This is a venue that is unsuitable for children to be learning and performing in. I have pictures here to show you about the state of the auditorium during those performances. And this is not the only example of schools in our town being unfit for learning. In a town such as Amherst, which pledges to value the education, value education, equity, and diversity, it is an absolute embarrassment that our schools are in such failing condition, and yet 
funding costs um, are continually proposed funding cuts. I urge you to find the money to fully fund the town and the regional district school budget. It is also your responsibility to engage UMass and Amherst College to make real Thank meaningful your financial contributions to this town. Our students deserve better and it is your job to do better for them. Thank, Thank you for your time. This is Thank just you. a picture so you can see what it looked like while Thank people you. were visiting. Next is and Kathleen is Mitchell. Hole next to the lights that water was pouring down from in the auditorium at the middle school. Thank you, your time is up. Kathleen Mitchell. Good evening. My name is Kathleen Mitchell. I'm a resident of um, District 5 in South Amherst and have two children in the Amherst schools um, who will enter the middle school in the next two years. I'm here tonight to ask the town council to prioritize our children by fully funding the regional school's budget. And I wanna speak specifically about two programs at ARMS. If forced to make cuts to the world language program, middle school students would get insufficient hours of instruction to move beyond the beginner level and would have to start their chosen language all over again in ninth grade. There would be little chance of reaching the AP level in a world language. This would be an unfortunate outcome for a community that has demonstrated its belief in the value of language acquisition and diversity by supporting a bilingual program at the elementary level. If the regional school's budget is not fully funded, the restorative justice program would be eliminated at a time when we know that adolescents are struggling with social and emotional skills and need this type of support. There has been so much talk in the community about how crucial it is that there is healing at arms and that the culture of the school improves, but this will not happen by magic. As a community, we either care about arms or we don't. I think that if you choose to fund this budget, you will find a significant amount of community support and many families and individuals willing to partner with you to roll up their sleeves and advocate for funding and think creatively about solving this ongoing problem. I have often heard members of this council talk about the importance of families in Amherst, of ensuring that our housing and zoning makes it possible for families to live here. But families also need thriving public schools not just at the elementary level in the form of a new building, but also in the form of an adequately staffed, high quality middle and high school. Many of you in various contexts have spoken about the value you place on our public schools. You have mentioned how your own families chose Amherst or, or because of the quality of the schools or how your own children thrive during their education here. All we are asking is that our children have the same opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I think it's May Vicente. I'm sorry, I can't read your handwriting. Is it May? Mari, thank you. Yeah, my name tends to throw people off. My name is Mari Vicente, and I'm a Spanish teacher at Amherst Regional High School. Um, and I want to tell you that the cuts in the language curriculum that were instituted at the middle school about 10 years ago cost us a little more than half a year in academic achievement for our students. On top of that, the pandemic cost close to a year, another year um, in academic achievement. And the block schedule is absolutely horrible for language teaching. So the students that I have now in intermediate Spanish, Spanish three, are about a year and a, and a bit behind of where they used to be a few years ago. Um, so it's become really difficult to prepare students for the advanced placement in Spanish, which is one of the crowning jewels of the high school. Um, and the Karen proposed cuts will even further delay um, our students' achievements in world language. These cuts translate into having the students de facto start their language careers at the high school instead of at the middle school. Um, and that is also on top of uh, we being the only country that starts language teaching as late as 12 years old, just in time when the brain, the part of the brain that deals with language starts to shrink. It's still possible but it's not as but what most countries do. Um, so as a result of this extra, even further cuts, kids would only have four years of their chosen language. At that point, it would definitely be impossible 
to achieve um, uh, the advanced placement course. Furthermore, our district recently started a dual language, pro language program at Hood River. Um, you, how would this interface with the lang dual language program? Thank you. Please fund the word language. Thank you. Olivia Blake. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Olivia Blaze. I'm a resident of Northampton and an Amherst educator. I teach Latin at the middle and one class at the high school. And I'm here today to ask you to please support our school committee's ask and fully fund their budget. Our students love our classes, speaking as a world language teacher. It's the high point of some of their days. It's a chance for them to make choices in their education, to learn about how to communicate with others, how to share about themselves, how to think about themselves as citizens in the world, to reduce their time when they are most eager, enthusiastic, and ready to soak up that knowledge would be a real shame. A couple of weeks ago, at the regional school committee meeting, many, many members of the public came and advocated against gutting our program. And the school committee listened and restored our positions in the budget. I ask you to support our community and fund the budget. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. William Rowdy. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is William Roundy. I'm the department head of world languages at the high school. Um, my colleagues have made great comments about what we're losing with the budget already. So I'm just gonna make a few separate points. Um, the cuts, if we cut deeply, are not just extraneous programs that um, feel like add-ons to some people. For instance, uh, we're deeply cutting the high school science department um, which is core academics. Um, and even with the budget that the school committee passed, we're cutting pretty deeply, um, almost to the bone. We're losing central office positions, custodial positions, and other things that aren't directly um, impacting students, but are in impacting our building um, pretty deeply. Um, so what the school committee is asking for is, I think, what we should do. Um, I don't think they are asking too much for a strong opening bargaining, bargaining position or anything. Um, it's already pretty tough. Um, the mood's pretty bad um, in the schools right now. Um, when we started talking about these budget cuts, um, I was pretty devastated and I'm a normally like pretty happy guy, but I'd have to say I haven't been happy in about a month. Um, and people don't show up in numbers like this unless you're really hitting a breaking point of some kind um, to get this many people politically activated is really a sign that something is wrong. Um, and I'd like you to really seriously consider what we're asking for. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Georgia Malcolm. Hello, everyone. You know, I'm never at a loss for words, but I'm so tired. I just put my name down because I really wanted to acknowledge the school committee for advocating and putting the money back in. I mean, I really, you know, <laughs> I would say to Mika back there, I'm like, I'm gonna say the opposite, don't approve it. Because what is it, what is it gonna mean for you guys? You know, unfortunately, this is statistics, right? The demographics of the schools are changing. It's almost, I mean, in terms of when you combine all the people of color, it's probably almost pretty close to white kids. And I think without you guys even knowing it, it's just some kind of, you know, it's kind of racism, this kind of white, supremacy, and I'm not trying to insult anybody, but it's just ingrained because I, I go through it with my colleagues in the school system. And 
you know, you're, you're not seeing. I think the school committee has a vision, right? Because you're living in Amherst, you want to put up this $40 million library. You know, yes, we're going to cut the schools and we're kind of raising the flag saying, hey, you know, everything is going to be not great. And you guys really aren't paying attention. And I say, fine, don't put the money in and see what happens in a couple of years because Amherst is going to be like this garbage pan. It's white, you paint it pretty on the outside and on the inside, it's filthy. So, I mean, I'm not going to beg you. You guys figure it out. You're elected to do the right thing. The school committee has done the right thing. But I am just saying, don't do it and see what happens. Thank you for your comments. Irene LaRoche. Hi, Irene LaRoche. I've been teaching at Amherst Mills School since 2003. Please support the school committee's budget. With the wide variety of students, each of our program meets different needs. The ARMS program is already operating under substandard conditions due to previous budget cuts in recent years. The ARMS program has four core subject areas organized into teams as a special education teacher. These core classes are heterogeneous with a wide variety of needs serving students on IEPs and 504s in an inclusion model. The core subject classes have experienced a 20% increase in class size in the last few years as core teaching positions have been cut. These cuts accompany changes in special education support. We no longer have general education paraprofessionals assigned to each team who used to be able to provide support in those classes. Run result uh, is that special education students who need support are moved then to one core class with one special ed teacher, which tips the balance of that class to create de facto tracking. The general education math and ELA classes in seventh grade are 30% IEPs, and the general education social studies and science are over 40% high need students. Each part of our school program is integral in having a high quality education and meets the needs of complex learners, English language arts, um, ELL, counseling, restorative justice, world language, exploratories, all of them are essential. A student with a reduced experience in exploratory will struggle to engage in required core classes. A student in an exploratory class who might have a conflict with another student may not be able to capably resolve that conflict without a restorative justice coordinator. A student who has reduced world language classes will have a harder time accepting their role as a global citizen, which is a hallmark of our social studies curriculum. The connections are limitless. Each part of the program is essential. We help students build the skills and the content they need to understand themselves and their world, a world that is connected, diverse, and interdependent. Please restore the budget that serves the whole child and our community. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Pat Topsky. Good evening. My name is Pat Nantupski. Uh, I'm from Holyoke. Please move to the mic, please. I'm from Holyoke, but I am a uh, special ed math teacher at the middle school. And before that, I was a special ed paraeducator at Fort River for seven years. Um, you have heard from much more eloquent uh, and smarter colleagues than I, so I'm going to keep it short. Um, but we are holding it together with duct tape and bailing wire at the middle school. Um, you are potentially considering a budget that will put the money back in for schools. I think that's important. Right now, you all have a choice to make because we don't get to decide, uh, but you can either take from and cut from our most vulnerable students, uh, or you can choose to build them up uh, I know it's a hard decision. We're doing a lesson right now on balancing equations, but you all have to find the money somewhere else. Otherwise, the other side of the equation is cut services. And I don't know that we're going to make it if we cut more services. I don't know that they're going to make it if we don't cut more, if we keep cutting services. So, you know, I hope you make the right choice. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Ben O'Connor. Mm -hmm. 
Vincent O'Connor, 175 Summer Street. I've distributed to the council a proposal for a uh, refugee and asylum applicant resettlement commission in writing. Um, and I look forward to meeting with the appropriate committee of the council to discuss this matter. On the matter before us, as councilors, you are operating in a political structure developed in medieval Europe to govern its illiterate rabble. We are not in Europe. This is 2024, and your constituents are not illiterate rabble. In a prepared statement at, at a previous meeting in March, a councillor spoke of the need of, of time for dialogue. The dialogue this community needs between the council and its citizens and its school committee is not just listening for two minutes, but engaging in real discussion at the finance committee, not just having a pre presentation and then having people have to listen to people talk about things that maybe they have gotten wrong. But the same thing should happen at your, at your um, April 24th or 25th public hearing. I think it is important for not only the substance of, of understanding, uh, the appearance of understanding by listening, but the substance of understanding by having dialogue at the finance committee and your public hearing um, so that we, so that whatever decision you make is a decision that your, the public will feel is a informed decision as the result of dialogue between you and the school committee, its, its professional staff people and the public. Thank you for your comment. That's everyone on the register. Thank you. That concludes public comment. We're going to move on to the consent agenda. After that, we will be moving to a presentation about the regional school budget and some discussion as and a vote to refer it to the Finance Committee. Uh, let me begin with the consent agenda. It's pretty straightforward to move the following items in the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 9A1, approval of extension of temporary police chief appointment. 11A, adoption of March 4, 2024, special town council meeting minutes. Is there a sec, uh, is there anybody that would like anything removed? Is there a second to the motion? Second. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to a vote. I'll begin with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Goth here. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Ka Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Thank you. I just want to point out for clarification purposes that the full, this tonight we were approving the full set of minutes for March 4th. When we held our meeting on the 13th, we were only accepting the record of the meeting from the time, from a certain time in the meeting to the end of the meeting. You had your hand up, Andy. Yes. Um, I don't know if Athena wants to uh, report this, but there was an amendment to the minutes made um, at my request. Yes. There was Athena? a correction on page three. I corrected the error and reposted the minutes. So the minutes that are in the packet now have been corrected. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have no resolutions or proclamations tonight. We have no presentation or discussion. The reason that the Amherst Pelham Regional School Budget appears under action items is because eventually it will be an action item. Um, we are going to um, begin with interim school <laughs> superintendent. Doug, you can come in. Um, 
Good evening, Dr. Slaughter. Um, Good evening. And we also then have comments from Regional School Committee Chair Sarah Best Kenny and Amherst School Committee Chair Sarah Marshall. I do want to note that it, both in the room and in the audience on Zoom are various members of the school committee as well, of the regional school committee as well as the um, uh, Amherst School Committee. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so I'm just going to take you through the budget a little bit and the process we went through to get to the budget that the school committee voted in and uh, has uh, submitted to the town for for uh, approval. So we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so what we usually do is, as part of our process is we make estimates for the coming fiscal year on what's called level services, which is to take um, our best estimates of what we are doing currently and trying to project that forward into the new, new fiscal year. Um, so for staff that involves uh, steps and colas, we project those for the coming year with the same level of FTE. We look at our various expenses and the ones we know. Um, we try to estimate what those will look like for the coming year. Uh, and so with that, uh, estimate of level services, it, you know, the budget would be $36,496,441. And that utilizes $500,000 in ESSER funds, and it's about 8.29% above the fiscal 24 budget. Um, really, the big things that are driving our cost increases from, from uh, the current year to next year are, are reduction in the number of ESSER funds available. So current budgets being supported by over $1.1 uh, $1 million, and so uh, a reduction of $500,000 of ESSER funds. Uh, we'll we'll have a six hundred fifty thousand more than six hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar decrease in funding that's supporting the budget. Um, you know uh, we're a people business. Uh, most of our costs are driven by uh, employees and and the benefits that they have, and so that's a pretty significant Im impact on our our budget year over year. Um, you know in the in the ballpark of um, eighty eighty five percent of our costs are related to employees. Uh, so when we have things like health insurance go up. Close to ten percent. It's a pretty significant, uh, you know, uh, expense in our in our budget. Uh, and then, you know, the the uh, inflation that's been persistent over the last couple of years is is continuing to to impact our budget in a, in a pretty significant way. And so it 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 pushes those numbers higher. And so we see that that large increase uh, of just just under eight point three percent overall. Um, we use an alternative assessment method for the regional schools. Um, just to give you a quick background on that, there's a statutory method. Any other method that, that, that we use as a regional school district is called an alternative assessment method. Uh, we use an alternative assessment method. Uh, we've worked with the four towns in the, in the regional school district to try to come to a, uh, an agreement about uh, how we assess each of the towns, their, their portion of the cost. Uh, the current method we have uses a five-year rolling average of what's called the minimum local contribution. Uh, as well as a five-year average of, of the student population. Um, and then we have an additional sort of guardrail that we've been applying over the last couple of years of 4% to sort of set the maximum amount that any given town could could increase or decrease in, in a given year. But if we look at that revenue, you know, using that assessment method we've used the last couple of years um, and other sources of revenue uh, from Chapter 70 to regional transportation reimbursement to uh, interest, et cetera, um, the gap between our level services budget and our funding using that assessment method is is uh, almost 1.7 million dollars, um, and so you know we we set about uh, you know trying to find what it was we could adjust or change or reduce from our budget in order to meet that number. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please. Um, and so we create a a list as we see up on the screen now of of adjustments, additions, and reductions. Um, to try to meet that number. So the first section at the top of this is, is our uh, adjustments. And some of these are, you know, refinements in, in estimates for expenses uh, from where we started. So we start this process back in, in November. Um, we're making our best guesses as what we think our health insurance is gonna cost us. We make our adjustments to what we think our, our uh, support from, from uh, or costs for utilities are going to be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, we, and as we go through the process, we try to refine those numbers and make adjustments accordingly. There's several things you'll see on here where it shows a negative, uh, which is the parentheses around the FTEs. And generally with that, what we're doing is we are shifting the cost from appropriation uh, type funding to revolving fund type funding. There are, are uh, opportunities for a regional school district to have revolving funds to uh, hold 
uh, resources and, and support certain programs. There are very specific rules about what revolving funds can or cannot be um, funded with. And, and the purpose of the of those funds are very specifically defined, but there are a few programs that we run that allow us to, to um, collect money and then use it to support the programs. And so over the last couple of years with ESSER funding being available, we've made a decided effort to, to push and or retain, I should say, uh, funds in our revolving accounts so that we'd have them available to us uh, in, in a year like this. And so, for example, uh, we, you know, if we take in students uh, to some of our programs in special education, we have a tuition revolving fund that we can, that we collect uh, those, those tuitions from those other districts, uh, and then we use it to support the program. So you have to, with a revolving fund, if it's allowed, then you have to use it for the program that it's uh, supporting and so in this case we're going to shift and 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 put four staff uh onto that revolving fund and so it takes them off of our um of our appropriated funds and so it reduces the burden on on the towns to to meet that that expense with with uh assessed money um and as you see there are a couple other places where we we have uh shifts of custodial staff uh when people rent our facility we charge them for the use and uh, then we use those funds to help support our custodial staff and then the last one is uh, we have an intensive needs program. Again, that one also collects tuition. It's the same revolving fund as the one at the top there, uh, but it, both of those are able to support um, uh, some of the staffing that's in, in those programs. And so those adjustments are ones we we make uh, that don't, although it looks like we're cutting 4.7 people, we're actually shifting them off of the uh, uh, appropriated part of the, of, of the budget. Um, so those are staff that are still going to work for us. They're just going to get paid from a different resource than, than our appropriated funds. Uh, in the section under, under budget reductions, that's when we're actually taking things out and doing less things. Um, and so, you know, there's a number of things. We, we looked at our central administration. We're making some reductions there. Um, we've got uh, some smaller adjustments where we're taking out just some expenses to try to meet that number of, of almost $1.7 um, we're reducing some of the professional development uh, with the custodial staff. The circumstance there is we added staff during the pandemic. We're, we're phasing into an area where we don't need as many staff uh, as we've had. And so we're able to, to, uh, to reduce our staff in that area. Uh, and then you get into the much more significant changes where we're, we're really having to reduce a significant number of staff relative to uh, trying to meet this, this target of almost 1.7 million. And, you know, when we do this process, I, I work with the administration in the buildings to go through and think about this and work, you know, we try to leverage uh, retirements and, and, and um, open positions and, uh, and also just, you know, what programming are our kids signing up for as far as classes and, and what things aren't they signing up for and other ways to be efficient by virtue of trying to leverage our schedule to our advantage. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some some other restructuring of, of how many departments we have. So department heads have release time. And so if, if we have fewer departments, that's fewer people getting release time to do department support work. Um, you know, that does have an impact. I mean, all of these things have impacts on on what we can and do offer to the kids. Uh, there's some some changes in the, the middle section there where it talks about our summer programming. Uh, the, because of how we've shifted our schedule over the last few years, there's opportunity to provide summer school in a little different way. So again, that that's an, a, a change to how we'll probably do our summer uh, support work and credit recovery type work. There's opportunities during the school year for kids to make that up. And so the need for summer school is much, much less. And so it's a much more sort of focused program that we're expecting to run this summer. Um, but then you see uh, the next section where we talk about middle school changes. Um, the class, uh, the clerical staff reduction is an addition we did this year to help out a little bit with the, with the uh, uh, changes to the middle school and the and the administrative structure we, we've got in place this year, and then uh, staff turnover is a is a generic sort of category that we we look at. It's you know when we reduce the number of staff, there are associated costs that go with staff, like some of them have health insurance, some of them don't, some you know, and so on. And there are other reductions just separate from just salary uh, that we can can apply to the budget. Uh, you know, uh, so in in speaking with the uh, you know, presenting the school committee, getting public uh, comment. Uh, school committee tasked me with with uh, you know adjusting this and not not making this level of reductions. And and effectively, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, 
to uh, essentially not have the teaching and paraprofessional positions uh, reduced from the budget. To do that, it's about 15 staff, a little over 15 staff, or $941,975 in expense that get added back to the budget if we do that. Um, and so the resulting reduction from a level services budget, instead of being one point almost $7 million, is about $750,000 or seven forty-seven eight ninety-six to be overly precise there. Uh, and so if we go to the next slide, uh, this is sort of what happens to the ads and cuts uh, or, or additions, adjustments, reductions that we have. And so what I've done here is the exact same slide as earlier, except the places where we had teaching staff or paraprofessional staff, we've zeroed those out. And so those don't, don't reduce our budget. And that's where you get to a target of the 747, uh, 896 in, in reductions that we have to make. Now, many of these are ones we would do regardless. You know, if we just don't have an expense or we can project that we don't have an expense, uh, like the reduction in our health insurance costs from our original estimate, that sort of thing, those are actual uh, real changes. We, regardless, we'd want to make that reduction in, in, in what we're having in our budget uh, because we just don't, we're not going to incur that, that expense because of the, the reduction in cost from what we were originally projecting. But, but nonetheless, uh, there's still pretty significant reductions in, in other areas within the budget even with this uh, modification from from a from a uh, 1.7 million dollars in cuts to 750 thousand dollars worth of cuts, and so if we go to the next slide, please. So what you see on this slide um, is is a uh, summarized uh, you know appropriation budget. What we've done in the in the uh, in the not the shaded column all the way to the far right, but in the the two columns uh, just preceding that. Uh, we have the proposed budget from fiscal 25. That's, that's where we started uh, before we started doing, you know, sort of additions, reductions, et cetera. Uh, and then in the adjusted, we've, we've taken some of those, we've taken those, those reductions that are spelled out on the previous page and, and applied them to the areas of the budget uh, and, and made the, the adjustments in the budget. And so what the school committee voted uh, at their meeting on the 14th of, of March was a, was a, a budget of thirty-five million seven hundred forty-eight thousand five hundred forty-five dollars, which is, which is a little over six percent from the current year, and that's uh, the total, the bottom of the next to last column on the right there, um, and that's just a little over two million dollars of increase in 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 cost from the current fiscal year and its estimates. Um, so the next question is sort of, well, how do we pay for that? What are our resources? Uh, what what did we assume or what can we assume relative to that? Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. And so on this slide, uh, this this sort of lays out what we think our, our, our uh, revenues look like for the coming year. Um, so if you look at the blue columns in particular, so the, the sort of middle two columns that have a highlight to them uh, in the, in the I have to say the header on that says 100% stat, stat is not truly 100% statutory method. That's the, it's vestigial from when we were transitioning to the method that we're using currently. But but more importantly, what you see there is is a level services budget, which is the 36,496,441, which is the same one we started with at the beginning of the presentation. Currently, we're projecting our chapter 70 to be uh, $9,793,627. Um, that increase of 0.78% from the current year, uh, I will say is actually, um, less than that in some respects. So the chapter seven number that's shown in the first column there that says, uh, fiscal 24, uh, is what we were projecting and what we voted, what actually happened when the, when the fiscal 24 budget was finalized at the state level, our chapter 70 number was a little bit higher than that. Uh, and so the actual increase, you know, over the actual revenue that we'll receive this year in chapter 70 is less than 0.78%. But, but the thing to keep in mind is we've got a $36 million budget and we're trying to fund a pretty big chunk of it with chapter 70. And when it goes up by less than 1%, that puts a lot of pressure on our assessment methods and our other, other sources of revenue to try to cover those costs. Um, so as we look down through the, the remainder of those revenue sources, we get a transportation reimbursement because we're a regional school district. Uh, that has been, uh, over the last couple of years, strongly, uh, they've been improving the, the reimbursement rate. Um, we think that's going to kind of hold steady for this year. Our current year uh, uh, estimate for that is around the 950000 mark. Uh, our budgeted number for fiscal 24 is lower than that, but I think our actual um, 
uh, projected uh, reimbursement for the current year will be closer to 950, and we're going to hold that steady for for fiscal 25. Um, Medicaid reimbursement, about $120,000. We provide uh, services that are eligible for Medicaid uh, reimbursement, so we do certain OTPT speech services that are eligible for Medicaid, and so we apply for that funding and we get that. Um, about 120,000 is a pretty typical amount from one year to the next. It varies. Um, charter reimbursement, that's our estimate of what we think we'll get for our brand new students that are in charter. So when a student goes to a charter, charter school, um, there's, a, there's a reimbursement as you transition to owning that cost. And so uh, with the regional schools, any seventh grader that's going to a charter school is in their first year relative to us. And so we get about $300,000 in, in charter reimbursement. That's our estimate of that. What you don't see here, but it's in the expense side of things, is that the cost to us uh, for those charter students uh, we, we carry as, a, as a, an expense line, that number's around $2 million, roughly speaking. So uh, you know the reimbursement is a transitional funding source from the state to, to ease you into covering that cost, but uh, charter costs are, are pretty significant uh, by, out of our, our resources. Um, interest revenue with interest rates being up, uh, and we have you know cash on hand for a variety of reasons, and so uh, thirty-two thousand is kind of in the right neighborhood for what kind of interest we earn in the course of a year. Um, e and D, which is uh, you know the same as sort of reserves or or free cash and and uh, and stabilization for a uh, municipality. Um, we generally budget two hundred eighty thousand as a contingency. We try not to spend that in the course of a fiscal year. We hold that as uh, in case of emergencies type of funding. Um, but we do have uh, additional funds available to us that we, we do leverage from, from one year to the next. And so we've got $600,000 of, of that funding budgeted. And, and the way we get E&D is the same way the town gets reserves. In other words, if you are, you know, when you finish your fiscal year, if you're under budget, that falls into the sort of reserve category. One, one difference is that in a regional school district, uh, there's a maximum amount that you can uh, retain in, in E&D, and that's 5% of your operating budget. So we have some obligation to to use those resources and not sort of stack them up and, and hold them. Um, so we're supposed to uh, to spend that funding in in a timely way to to uh, support our budgets. And so we try to carry that that uh, from one year to the next and use a little bit each year. And and so when we finish under budget one year, it helps support that E and D for a subsequent year and and it it helps you know sort of smooth out our our funding picture a little bit from one year to the next. But the totality of those other sources of funds, besides assessments to the town, it's a little over $12 million. We subtract that from our 36, 496, 441. And so the amount to be assessed to the four towns falls in, in the 24 million, 420, um, And because of you know either no change in those estimates for revenue or small changes in those estimates for revenue, that's why that increase from fiscal 24 to this year is, is 11.62%. So it's a pretty, pretty big uh, uh, increase to cover the costs that, that we're anticipating. And so if we use the assessment method uh, and, and you know, with the five-year rolling average of minimum local contribution and the remainder of that, that uh, amount to be assessed uh, based on a five-year rolling average of, of, of students, uh, this series of numbers, the 19,706,938 for, for the town of Amherst would be the, the sort of full uh, assessment you would have to bear in order to, to hold us at level services. Um, and likewise, you can see the impact on the other three towns. Um, you know, in, in, in the most recent years, we've, we've had a, uh, a set of guardrails of 4% as a maximum increase. Um, and so as I started in the presentation to do that, we would have to cut about 1.7 million. The regional school committee asked me to, to restore the, the, the teaching and para provision uh, positions, and so that that's a much smaller amount of reduction, and so uh, the guardrails of four percent were going to support that. So, essentially, I I modified the guardrails in order to uh, to meet that level of, of reduction that we had had uh, been able to identify that it did not involve um, teaching and paraprofessional pos positions. So that just shy of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and so that creates an increase above the current year assessment of about 8.2% for every every one of the four towns. Uh, and so that's <clears throat> a little more than double the increase from, from what we spoke about in, in February. Um, but that is that is the budget that was was passed 
by the regional school committee on the 14th. Um, the final slide, and I'll, I'll do this quickly just as a, as a reference, and so if you get that last slide, is, is the capital uh, projection. So capital is another part of the budget. Um, the regional school committee reduced the projected uh, projects for the coming year, and so the debt authorization that they went through was a much, much smaller. They took $300,000 out of that. Doesn't impact fiscal 25, but it would have an impact on fiscal 26. Uh, those numbers are not shown in this in the in the chart at the bottom of the page there where it has the assessment the fiscal 25 24 and 25 numbers are are accurate 26 and above have not been modified relative to this smaller uh capital project uh uh and debt authorization that was approved by the by the regional school committee so they they uh you know we're trying to be forward thinking and saying all right we're gonna we're gonna push out some of these projects they can we can hold off on those uh we'll take a little less debt on and and potentially have a positive impact on on uh, some of the subsequent years of the capital planning uh, from a financial uh, request in, in assessment. So the assessments for capital are in the column labeled fiscal 25. Uh, those have been consistent throughout the, the, the budget season. Um, but I uh, did want to share those with you. But but the larger conversation is probably much more about the, the operating budget and, and the assessments there and, and the uh, additions, reductions, et cetera, that, that match with that. Uh, so I think I'll stop there because I yeah. blitzed through that really quickly. I'm sorry if I went too quickly and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. I, this is very yeah. familiar to me. And so I go through it relatively rapidly and I'm sorry if I've skimmed over something that wasn't familiar to anybody or, or has, uh, provoked some questions. I'm happy to answer any. So why don't you just stay right where you are and Sarah Bess, why don't you come up? This is Sarah Bess Kenny. Sarah Bess is the chair of the Regional School Committee. Hi, y'all. Okay, uh, so Doug, we asked Doug to go back through. Please, oh. yes, thank you. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay, so our original budget that was presented, which we dubbed the Tuesday budget in our meeting for clarity, uh, we reviewed and um, Many of the cuts that were proposed were student facing and greatly going to change the student experience um, in, in our schools. And as the school committee, our job is to um, approve a budget that you know, supports our students the best we can uh, and, and honors our district mission, which includes you know, high quality education, multicultural, multi-ethnic and pluralistic societies, and ke keeping our schools as healthy and robust as we can. Um, and so we asked the business office to put back in the student facing positions. Uh, we are still making cuts that still affect students. Um, it still includes um, two uh, FTE from central office, two janitorial staff and one clerical. And then as uh, Dr. Slatter presented in the last slide, we reduced our um, capital uh, proposed capital projects. So. Okay. okay. All right. Um, just take a moment. And Sarah Marshall, did you want to say a few words? Thank you. I'm Sarah Marshall, a member of the Amherst and Regional School Committees. Um, my role as chair of the Amherst commi uh, School Committee, however, doesn't give me, I'm just another member of the regional committee. Um, all the speakers during the public comment part of this meeting were spot on and very articulate in outlining the damage that might be caused will be caused, we'll see, we hope will not be caused by the um, cuts that would be needed to um, limit the assessment increases to 4%. But I'll give my written remarks. Education has long been a priority and economic driver for the Amherst area. A significant portion of the area population lives here specifically because of the educational offerings not only at the college and university level, but at the elementary and secondary levels as well. 
Unfortunately, the ability of the regional schools to offer the high quality programming that so many people demand and that our children surely deserve is threatened by inadequate funding, chiefly at the state level, as Dr. Slaughter just pointed out. And after years of whittling away at programs and staff, at administrators and classes, we were faced this winter with the prospect of devastating cuts amounting to $1.6 million, cuts that cannot be made without significant changes to student learning and staff responsibilities. We implore you to fund the budget that we have submitted, even though it will require significantly more funding than was offered at the Four Towns meeting. We know it's a big ask, but parents, students, educators, and staff tell us loudly and clearly that a shrinking and mediocre program is unacceptable. Please also understand that our regional schools are in competition with private and charter schools and that more students will go elsewhere if they need to, to get the language and music instruction, the arts, the counseling, the academic supports that are no longer available at the Amherst middle or high schools, and that they take significant taxpayer funds with them. Please strengthen and do not weaken our schools. Thank you. Thank you. I think the three of you can just sit there in the hot seat, okay? Um, we're going to start with comments, questions from the council. I want to remind people that this is just the beginning of the conversation for this council with the regional school budget. We have a hearing scheduled on the 25th at 6.30. It will be totally virtual. It's a meeting of the finance committee that other members of the council may join in. Um, with that, uh, and our vote tonight is to refer the budget to the finance committee where it will rest until they come back to the council with their recommendation. And then as each of you knows, uh, then it becomes a decision-making process across four municipalities. And that involves three town meetings and our town council. So we're again, just at the beginning of that process. Um, so with that, Kathy, um, go ahead. I, yeah, I'm just going to focus on two elements that Doug went through quickly, and I know this is more long term, but I'm also thinking we should be putting pressure on the state. I just did a quick math of chapter 70 had gone up by 4% rather than less than 1%, it would be another uh, roughly $400,000. Um, I can't understate what the charter formula is doing to devastate our schools, and it's year after year. We're sending a net, Doug showed the amount we get off the top, but we're sending a net of over $20,000 for each of the 82 students that leave. We only send 5,000 if they go to another public district school. If we sent 10,000 rather than five, it would be the million you're asking for every year, year after year. So I think we need to um, organize a, uh, with our state legislators, a change in the formula, but more immediately, Chapter 70, we talked about the fair share amendment. Very little of it went directly into school budgets. A little bit went into some capital for K through 12. Um, we had a discussion about uh, student debt at the college level, but we're vying for the same pot of money. And I think people really need to say that at the at the most basic level, we need to protect K through 12. And in this case, we're talking about regional, you know, be, because it's our kids. So I just wanna focus on those two because they're such big numbers. You know, on the Amherst side, I was looking at the amount more money um, that it would be for Amherst for, we had 4% and this would be 8%. So just calculating that. And we can start to talk about that at the finance committee. Um, it was pointed out by one public comment that we went up to 10.5 on the capital budget, 10.5%, that extra 0.5 rather than 10 is about $400,000. You know, so there's, there's pieces of money that cause pain somewhere else. There's not, there's not a little pocket somewhere that, that we can just dip into, but it's, it's, um, and, and Sarah is on the 
Joint Capital Planning Committee. I mean, taking a hard look at what needs to be spent, it might mean we have to relook at our guidelines. So I'll stop there rather than looking at some of the detail because I haven't had a chance to look at the underlying detail, but our two kids uh, went through the middle school and the high school. And I have to tell you, when they hit college, they were so well prepared. And beyond that, they had this extremely diverse experience of friendships across all these different programs. And I would just, and they're 44 and 40 now. So we're talking about a long time ago, but, but they look, they, they treasured the time in our middle school in our high school for, for what that experience brought to them. And I, as a counselor, would like to have that continue to be an experience in Amherst. So thank you all very much. Okay, Pam Rooney. Thank you. Um, if, if I were looking at the chart, which is, uh, it says FY 2025 proposed budget, and it has the payroll accounts and the expense accounts at the top, if maybe we could look at, see that. Um, a couple, a couple of basic questions. Um, if someone would take the time to explain um, how our Amherst vote affects other towns, first question. Second question is, um, does choice in payment for special ed uh, it was mentioned a couple times that we get tuition for for special ed and we get tuition for regular ed choice in does choice in for special ed tuition cover the actual cost of special ed education um, when i look at when i look at the any of the proposed numbers the the um, payroll accounts for special ed exceed that of regular education. And I don't know how many students are supported in special ed as opposed to reg regular ed. Um, in the ex expense accounts, just the top, oh, five or six lines, which is regular education, special ed, other programs, student programs, school administration, central administration. If someone could describe what expense accounts means. It's it's in the realm of $5 million. So it's really becoming real money. It's, um, anyway, that's the question. What, what does that consist of? Thank you. Doug. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to go through those. So there's a couple of things. Um, so there's school choice and then there's also tuition in. So for when I was, when I was speaking earlier about uh, collecting tuitions from special education students, those are are into our specific programs, which is different than school choice. It's an actual placement like we have. Uh, there are a, you know, some students that we have that we don't have programming for for special education purposes, and we uh, uh, will send those kids to what we call out-of-district placements. Uh, we are receiving district in a similar way. So when we, when we uh, charge for that, uh, we're trying to estimate when we, we set up the, the billing technically uh, with them, we're trying to charge for, for what we're incurring. Separately, school choice, which is, um, you know, we are a school choice district. We do accept school choice students. The base amount for any student that's a school choice student, so uh, is is five thousand dollars. If they have special education costs, those are then calculated, and and we do a process called school choice claims, where we essentially bill back the districts that send to us, and so we do recover those costs uh, one to one. So so special education costs definitely. Uh, in in both of those circumstances are are ones that are covered by uh, by those sending districts. Um, see if I can remember all the questions. Um, so, um, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Uh, other was how how does the Amherst vote affect the other towns? So uh, so the way it works is this, and I'm gonna this is gonna get a little technical about how the budget process occurs. Um, so there. Are, there are really three parts to getting a regional budget passed. There's a capital assessment that all four towns have to agree to. Um, in the operating budget side of things, there's really two pieces to that. There is the assessment method itself, and then there is the actual you know sort of numbers, the operating budget itself. And so both of those have to have to pass for uh, the regional schools to have a budget. Because we use an alternative method, all four towns must agree to that. Uh, that alternative method for the budget to pass. So we can have, on the other hand, on just the dollars and cents part of the operating budget, 
three of the four have to pass it. But with the assessment method, because it's an alternative method, all four must agree to it. So if any one town rejects the assessment method, uh, we don't have a budget. Um, uh, and if two towns reject the sort of numeric part of the, the budget, that also uh, would, would have us not be uh, able to have a budget for, for the coming year. So that's, uh, so each of the towns has a fair amount of power to, to, uh, to reject a budget um, by virtue of that. Um, you'd ask a little bit about uh, special education costs. Um, so payroll accounts at the top are all about salaries, basically. That's just all salaries up there. Expenses um, are a variety of different things. Some of it's, you know, instructional supplies. It's, you know, whiteboard markers and workbooks and paper and, and things of that sort. But it's also things like some of the replacement equipment for Chromebooks or, or technology that particular kids need. And so in special education, you might have an adaptive type of, of technology that someone needs. That's in the expense accounts. Um, sometimes it's for uh, services that we need that we can't provide ourselves. So sometimes we have to contract those out. Um, if we have difficulty either hiring staff that we'd like to have, we'll contract out services. Or if it's something specialized that we don't offer or we don't have or need it on a regular basis, we'll often contract out uh, for those services. So it's a whole host of different things that fall into those categories. Um, a little over, you know, probably in the 23, I don't know the number off the top of my head exactly. It used to be more closer to 20, but it's it's crept up a little bit in recent years. The number of, you know, the percentage of our students that, that have uh, special education needs is is about 23% uh, or so. It's it's not quite to 25%, but it's it's gone up over the last few years. Um, but special education services are often expensive and they're and they're largely compulsory. In other words, we when, when an IEP or an individualized education plan gets written, it's something that's agreed to between the, the district and the families uh, relative to how best to meet their students' needs uh, so they can access the curriculum. And so it is uh, intended to be the least restrictive form to for those students to, to access curriculum. Um, uh, but it often involves a variety of, of staff that provide a variety of services depending on the kid and what their needs are. Um, and so that it's it's, just on a base level, it's more expensive than than kids that don't have IEP. Um, just to, you know, the, it just requires a higher level of sophistication and staffing to do that, uh, and sometimes equipment too. I think I got. I hopefully I got all the different pieces you ask about. Okay, Mandy Jo. I'm sorry, Councillor Hannigan. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions to hopefully take advantage of the fact that we have Sarah Bass Kenny, our regional school committee chair here, and two members of our regional school committee, because I don't know whether they'll be at finance or not. Um, does the regional school committee intend that the FY25 budget as they passed, so the higher one than what we had been looking at, is do they intend it to be the base for the FY26 budget and all future budgets, or um, would the original one that would 900,000 lower be the base? In other words, is this budget as passed that increases um, what the four towns were looking at by 900,000, a permanent increase in the budget by 900,000, or is this a one-year adjustment? Um, I'm gonna ask all my questions, they're kind of all related. Um, why did the regional school committee wait until April to relay their concerns to the four towns through passing a budget higher than what was discussed at any of the four towns meetings and guidance instead of making the case at either the January four towns meeting when we knew 20 positions would need to be cut um, or calling an additional four towns meeting in February or March? Um, what has the regional school committee done over the past three years to strategize for the fiscal cliff that we knew was coming and talked about um, that is here in FY25? What what did you do to prepare for it? Um, how did you talk about it? Um, and related to that, um, of the level services budget, um, the presentation indicated that 600,000 of this quote, 1.7 million reduction or now 0.8 million reduction is because there is $600,000 less in ESSER budget support than there was in the current fiscal year budget. Um, but ESSER money wasn't, was always known to not be permanent. Um, so did you have a plan for the loss of that ESSER money? I noticed also that 500,000 
in the FY25 budget is ESSER money that will not be there at all next year. Um, and where is the strategy for making up that loss to in coming years? I can answer the first one. So, so the first you, question is around a one-year adjustment or not. Uh, you know, if if we adopt the the budget as passed, so it involves an assessment method of you know with guardrails of eight point two percent, that essentially sets the base because it is the base of assessment that that gets charged to the four communities. So it, it would, to my mind, be the the basis of 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 the budget for the coming fiscal twenty six. Um, you know, if if that additional funding had been asked for in a different way. Uh, then it potentially, you know, sort of external to the budget, then it would be more of a one-time uh, uh, version. So I would, I would suggest it's, it's a, it's an adjustment to base. Thank you. I would say, um, if I could add that we did discuss whether to um, pass a, a, a budget with a lower base and ask for one-time extra. <laughs> money that wouldn't then be part of the next year's um, base. And that did not fly. So I think it's pretty clearly, or it's clear to me the intent of the committee to just build this right in. Yeah. Sarah Best, did you have comments? Um, you sp speak, please speak to the mic. <clears throat> uh, okay, so sorry, yeah. So we have actually, um, after the four of our people have talked to our four towns, and one of the things we have asked the business office to um, create and present for us is a three-year look ahead. We'll do exactly what you're asking about. How will this look for our future? Um, uh, and what were your other questions? Sorry. <laughs> So one of my questions was about four towns meeting. We knew these 20 cuts positions were presented in Feb in January's four towns. Um, why did you wait till April to tell the towns it was unacceptable instead of calling four towns meetings in February or March to discuss this? Uh, I think we didn't know exactly what was going to end up being cut. Um, and so that's that's why we, I, can I in can addition I <laughs> in addition to with the look ahead that we've asked the uh, business office to to do for us. One of the other things is we would like to have another four towns meeting so the four towns can come together and hopefully review the three year look ahead and um, you know have more discussions about how to not only manage for this year but also to manage for our future years. But there is a four towns meeting at this point. Uh, the tentative date is the 20th of April, um, that does not answer the question. It just places that piece of information out there. Uh, Councillor Haneke, did you have a follow up? I guess three three year look ahead looks to the future. One of my questions was what in the last three years have you done to plan for the cliff that we're in now since we knew it was coming? That might be more for Dr. Slaughter um, as finance or business, to put whatever his title was before acting superintendent. Um. Finance director, essentially. Uh, there's a few things we've done. I mean, you know, certainly we knew that 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 this was coming and there's a certain, uh, you know, limit to what, what we can do. I mean, certainly uh, I hinted at it a little bit, a number of, of revolving funds. Uh, we've, we've intentionally, um, uh, School choice being another one of those where we've allowed the 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 funding to uh, grow a bit um, in order to have a little more resource available over the next few years. So our tuition account, which we're using a little bit of this this uh, next couple of years, this sort of adjustment section of of that uh, adjustments uh, reductions and ads, uh, you know, we're starting to leverage those those resources that we've. Um, uh, I want to say stacked up, but we stacked up over the last couple of years. So we used, you know, so there's a few things there that we've done. And, and, and as you'll note from that, um, you know, the, the, the idea being that we can sustain uh, some of that support, you know, for example, the, the tuition, you know, support's going to is, is 
for special education is about 125,000. If you take the sort of top and the bottom one, we think we can sustain that for a year or two. And obviously that gives us more time. Uh, you know, we're sort of spreading this out over a longer period of time uh, to not make it as abrupt, but nonetheless, it's still a pretty ab abrupt change. Um, to be honest, in, in the fiscal 24 budget, it, it was, um, you know, we would have had to have, of leveraged less, uh, uh, SR funds to in the current year to make next year, not look quite so bad, but then we'll also have, you know, as you noted, um, a $500,000 sort of difficulty to overcome when we, we start to plan for fiscal 26. Um, so I think there's a few, th you know, there's a few things we've looked at with regard to that. We've, we, you know, we have limited, um, limited tools to do that. I think the, you know, there, there will be some reductions that are coming. It's a matter of when and how abruptly we do them. And so, um, and I think that, you know, that's the other thing in looking at a three-year sort of forward projection is sort of see what, what, uh, what kind of reductions we have, what kind of reductions in, in enrollment we have over those next period of years as well. Um, and it, it gets difficult to sustain the variety of programming we have uh, if we have a continually a continuing decline in enrollment. So that's it's there's going to be some trade-offs here we're going to have to make because you know we're currently at under 400 students in the middle school, under nine un, under 900 students in our high school. It's difficult to sustain the wide variety of things with uh, with that few students. And so, do we start to look at more school choice? Do we look at other kinds of options uh, as we move forward. Um, and and I think that, you know, we've, we've as much as these are difficult conversations uh, to, to have relative to these these budgets, I think there are, there are other districts that are in, in tougher shape than we are. I mean, not that that matters <laughs> when we vote our budgets, but I think that we've tried to, to leverage the funds in a, in a sort of sustained and tapering type of way. And yet it's still a pretty significant sort of step down between each of these last few years uh to to mitigate that and and not everything that we've um had to put in place over the last few years is able to be removed just yet um i think we see some higher needs in in some aspects of our our uh our students that that require continued additional support so it's difficult to make those reductions um in and around sort of mental health supports and and the impact that has on on some of our special education needs and and that sort of thing. So, um, we'll continue to have these difficult conversations. Uh, I think over the next couple of years because I think that there's no, I I'm not aware of any sort of major shift in funding sources that that anyone's. Um, I think there are ideas about what can happen, what will or will not come to fruition over the next couple of years. Going to be difficult to to to. Uh, say with any certainty because I think there's a I think there are a large number of districts that are like our districts that are that are in this minimum aid cir circumstance and when it's such a big chunk you know it, it, the other way to look at it I, uh, uh, Councilor Shane mentioned this but I I looked at the funding level at you know uh, I think it was 2014 versus now for chapter 70 as a percentage of the budget it was like 31 percent of the budget well if it was still 31 percent of the budget we wouldn't have this conversation about a million dollars. You know, we just wouldn't. Um, not that it was going to sustain or or has ever sustained it at an inflationary rate, but nonetheless, even if it was approximating that. So this is sort of the reality of of the Student Opportunity Act, and we all voted for it. I think the the resources that it's applying to districts like Holyoke and Springfield and Lowell and places like that uh, are are well placed resources, but it 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 puts a burden on on communities like ours to carry that. Uh, for the rest of the Commonwealth. So that's that's a piece of this too. Andy Steinberg. Yeah, the, excuse me. I first want to acknowledge to the people who are still in the audience that were here before and spoke that um, I appreciated all of your comments because it really does um, put the context on a very difficult decision that ultimately has to be made. But I, it, there are a number of troubling aspects that have been uh, raised in the discussion that has taken place already. Um, and part of it is that we're not alone. There are 218 uh, minimum aid districts in the Commonwealth, including regional and uh, 
town districts. So it, it's a fairly large, it's a large number. There, there's more that are minimum made districts than are um, not as, as far as I'm aware. And uh, so the, uh, the other thing that's happening to all of the districts is that everybody had ESSER funds. Some used it differently than others. Everybody has their ESSER funds being de um, eliminated. And it's happening at the same time that the Student Opportunity Act is being implemented, which is where that minimum aid number comes from. So there's a, a lot of challenges that we face, but there's one long-term challenge that uh, I think we also need to recognize, and that is that even before this all happened, um, the inflation annually in school budgets was greater than the revenue increases that was available to districts um, because districts ultimately rely strongly on property taxes, which have a two and a half percent cap. And uh, what the legislature can provide and uh, in the best of years, we were seeing two to 3% increases so that um, when the school budgets were um, continually going up, and if you look back at what was happening each year, there were small cuts being made each year. Um, and uh, you know what I think is really tragic this year, in addition to the cumulative small cuts that have happened over a great number of years, is that you know now we're facing a cliff as opposed to uh, you know just a steep you know a hill it's it, this is just really uh was look, making us look at a cliff so i i recognize all of those things and i have been working as you know with the uh, massachusetts municipal association to look to look into the fiscal policy issues but they're not easy solutions uh, best we can do is to continue to work together to present to the legislature. Now, the other thing that I want to turn to is the local side of it, just to put it into context and why it's going to be a, a very difficult decision that this council is making as the other three towns are making these decisions at town meetings where uh, we, we in Amherst uh, have our community will speak to us and then we will uh, make the best decision that we possibly can. But uh, the amount of uh, additional reduction that we're being asked to look at because of the uh, change in the budget from what was discussed at the four town meetings, for Amherst is about $740,000. And to give that $740,000 a little bit of context, if we're going to do that by shifting from other expenditures that we envisioned for the budget, and I'm not picking on this one program I'm going to mention because no decision has been made, but it's greater than the entire budget of the Crest Department uh, by about $100,000. So I just want to give you a context what it means to ask us to come up with $740,000. Somebody during uh, public comment mentioned the possibility of taking it from reserves. Most of our reserves uh, we've been setting aside for uh, capital projects that still remain to be built. Fire station, which is long overdue to be constructed be built to serve uh, South Amherst and to replace a very antiquated station that is unhealthy for the community and unhealthy for the staff to be working there in the Department of Public Works building, which is one of the most deplorable buildings that we have staff to work in in the entire town. So there are um, consequences. And then there's one other, which is, um, everybody uh, points out on a regular basis how deplorable our roads are 
and uh, that the other piece that has to be put into play, and there's, good, and there's no question that uh, it's going to affect the amount of money that's available for all capital, including loans. So I uh, just encourage through the um, process that we uh, hear from the community. Point of order, Count Councilor Steinberg, would you please use your microphone? You're, you're not oh, able to be I'm heard. I'm sorry, I, I lost it there. I, my finger fell off of it. Uh, the uh, um, I'll, I'll con I'm just concluding now, but what I was what I was saying is is that we really uh, need to have our community understand the depth of the problem and the depth of and the cost of the solving the problem if we're going to come up with the money um, and uh, we're going to have to make that decision. I assume that the other towns. Uh, in the region are having similar discussions going forward. Um, it's going to be a tough one. Thank you. Jennifer Top. Um, <clears throat> yeah, pardon me. I'm just thinking out loud, but it's such a catch-22. I mean, we know for Amherst to remain a viable community, we need to sustain and expand our year-round population, especially of families with children to send to our schools. And we need to maintain um, a robust student body or keep a student body at a certain level in order to have a robust curriculum and have enrichment classes. And if our schools aren't top notch with that kind of um, robust curriculum, then we can't, we're challenged to entice families to move here and pay our high taxes. So, um, I mean, it, it seems, I know this isn't gonna help us for fiscal year 25, but long and short term that our colleges and university really need to step up <laughs> and provide more support because our current economic model of only residential property taxes, you know, supporting the town is just not cutting it. Um, I also just wanted to ask in terms of anticipating, we knew that the, you know, ESSER funds would be, that they had a lifespan, but are you finding that the academic setback and other kind of fallout from the pandemic and students not being in person in school for almost two years, that the fallout from that is exceeding the lifespan of the ESSER funds. So it's hard to cut back when you need to still make up for that. Okay. Please speak into the mic. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, George? Yeah, um, I don't know if you can answer this right now. Maybe this is something that'll come to FinCom, but I would be, two questions. I'd be curious to know how much of ESSER money was spent for one-time expenses as opposed to recurrent costs. Um, I'd really like to know. What I think that's going to be an answer down the road. Right, I, and I mentioned that because there's a town right next to us that's going through the same process we are, and they're not having a fiscal cliff. And that's because they spent all the ESSER money on one-time costs. I was thinking of that leaking roof that was mentioned earlier. Um, maybe, anyway. So I'm just curious, how much of the ESSER money was spent on recurring costs? How much was spent on one-time costs? The other has to do with the impact of the, the new contracts. I'd just be curious how much of the gap is reflected in the new contracts that have been then signed. I assume that had a substantial impact. I just don't know, so I'm curious. I can answer that second one a little bit. Um, so uh, there's a couple of pieces to this puzzle. One thing I would broadly suggest, and as we as we head to the four towns meeting, I'll, we'll get into this a little bit more, but as an organization, we've gotten younger. Um, so most of our contracts, uh, certainly all of our union contracts have uh, are structured with uh, various lanes. Uh, so depending on in the teacher contract, it's education level, but in others, it depends on on the type of work you do. Um, and we have steps. Um, and so, you, you know, when you come to workforce, you get placed on a, on a given lane and step. And then over time, uh, you, you know, you get a step plus a cola. But then at some point, you get to the top of the scale and you just get a cola. So when I first started working for the district many years ago, we were about 70% of the staff were at the top step or close to 70% of the staff. 
that's a much lower percentage now, which puts a lot more inflationary pressure from one year to the next. So the raw dollars are less, but you have a step and a cola for a, num a larger number of staff. So that's one piece that plays into just generally speaking, regardless of what the cola is or anything else that we've just gotten younger as an organization and most organizations have, um, particularly with the pandemic. I think everybody shifted a little bit younger in, and I say younger, not necessarily, you know, age, but younger in their career with us relative to the, to the grades and steps. So that's one piece. Um, so the, um, the second thing is, uh, you know, sort of what you negotiate for a cost of living increase. So, you know, uh, a percentage point makes a big difference, um, but maybe not as much as you might think it would. Um, so if, if we were to say, um, broadly speaking, if uh, most of the most of our union uh, agreements had a 3% COLA for the current uh, for fiscal 25, not all of them, some of them are in negotiations now, but broadly speaking, if we take those that had that sort of 3%, if it was zero, um, at the regional schools, that's about a half a million dollars. Uh, a percentage point is in the 150, 160 range, uh, generally speaking, is a broad metric of, of that. And yet, you know, um, the counter to that is those were fully, you know, uh, fairly negotiated contracts. And so we had to come to agreement. Um, uh, and, and, in, you know, inflationary pressures are, are real. So when we have, you know, when, when, when we talk about health insurance going up 9.74% this year, yeah, the district has their cost go up 9.74, but all the employees that pay their, their piece of that also has that go up 9.74. Um, so, you know, they're, hit, they're getting hit with some of those same costs we are, and that's not to diminish the impact, but, but it is, you know, it is a factor. I think that the fact that we've gotten younger is, is putting a little more inflationary pressure on our, our budgets year over year. Um, uh, and that's the nature of having contracts that have, you know, sort of steps and, and colas as a part of how, how they're structured. Um, but I think a lot of districts are in the same boat as we are because, you know, baby boomers are retiring or have retired. Um, that's sort of tapering to the end. Um, and so, you know, new staff are coming in and, and are not at the, the very top of the of the uh, of the salary scale, the other thing you have, and it's not as much uh, a factor in say our our teaching category, but some of our other contracts, you know, with the minimum wage going to fifteen dollars, you get some compression between the bottom and top of the, of the of the salary scale, um, but it does tend to put you know pressure on the entirety of the scale to to move everyone's salary up as well. So those are all you know pieces of the puzzle. Uh, no real you know sort of straight line connections between some of them, but at the same time they're they're there and they are. Uh, you know, they are factors in, in influencing our, our labor costs. And since we are so labor intensive, uh, as far as our costs are concerned, um, anytime those things impact labor, it's a much more profound impact on our overall budgets. And back to the question on uh, how much for one-time things versus ongoing things. Uh, we had a mix, um, you know, we did some one-time funding. There were sometimes, there were some positions we funded for, for a short period and we've tapered those out of our budget. There's some things we've been we've been supporting, and we thought we would be tapering more of them out, and we haven't been able to yet. So it's it's kind of a mix. Would be the the sort of broad answer at this point. Um, I can look more closely at the at the specific specifics of that. Um, there are some things we, that we definitely bought that were one one time sort of things. Um, uh, leveraging the ESSER funds for capital expenses was a bit involved. You couldn't um, you had to do uh, a fair amount of of um, effort to allow it to be used for capital expense. So it had to be kind of a careful structuring there. So we didn't do as much of that, uh, as much as we have capital needs as, as you know, you've know, you probably seen in, in some of our documentation and given the ages of our buildings, but but uh, it was it, it was a non-straightforward process to do very much in, in, the, in, in the realm of capital with ESSER funds. Um, I'm concerned about how I heard you talk about revolving funds. Mm -hmm. uh, so you built them up in over this period, say from COVID, and now you're using them as a way to help make it not be as bad. But even that has a limited life, correct? Correct. So the idea is to make the, the shrinking happen over a longer period of time as opposed to Got it. Severe sort of steps. Got it. I just want to make sure I understood that one because it, it's kind of like Esser. I mean, it's not going to be there forever. Right. 
and you built up some reserves in those and now you're using those to make it slightly less painful. Right. Okay. Um, the other, there's a couple other realities out there. East, some of the Eastern Mass towns actually are gaining some population, but we're not. And as much as I hope and would love Amherst to be able to attract more young families to it, the reality is the birth rate isn't there. We know already who is in kindergarten today and where they will be in 12th grade. And so we need to be planning in a way that understands what the school population actually looks like. In addition to that, people are migrating out of the Northeast, not to the Northeast. And if we think this looks bad, wait for about three years when it hits higher ed and they start seeing the real problems, even in our own town. So that's a reality. I, I just have hope. I have serious hope that we can find creative solutions to continue to offer the best possible variety of courses to a shrinking high school population so that in fact, we can continue to be very proud of not just where our kids go to college, but for those kids that don't go to college, the kinds of future they can look at. And I really urge that no matter how this budget comes out this year, that that planning process needs to get serious and it needs to have some real expertise brought into it. And it has to involve conversations across the Commonwealth because the solutions are gonna have to be across the Commonwealth. We're not alone. You've said it many times. So somehow or another, as we, as you know, Amherst, put our faith and our hope in our schools, we've got to ask that you not put off this really serious, serious planning for the future any longer. I know we're looking for a new superintendent, et cetera. Let's hope they're ready to take it on because we can't be sitting here every year asking for an 8% increase in our budget for the schools. And there is no way that I see the state making it up. Somebody said at one point, Chair, Chair Sarah Marshall and I discussed, oh, let's do a campaign for chapter 70. And then I realized we'd be going to the state to try to get about $80,000 more. And I said, how much time can I spend on trying to get $80,000 more from the state? You know, it isn't, chapter 70 is killing us. And charter. It's killing, and charter. And it's really hurting a wide variety of school districts. But Amherst has to figure out our future. And it has to be a future where we stay invested in our kids and we figure out using things like technology to make sure we can continue to offer the variety of classes that we are able to offer now. I don't have a question. I'm sure I'll have more, but you answered the one about revolving funds. Pat DeAngelis. Thank you. Uh, you know how when you have a pebble in your shoe, it can be really small, but it keeps bothering you. I uh, have a very minor question in this very large structured budget. Uh, the reduction of capital projects, okay? And we're being told, not me for the first time, about leaking ceilings or pipes that have flooded auditoriums and rooms. So is that being addressed this year as a capital project? What's happening? with that specific pebble? So we've, you know, 
we knew we were needing a roof at the middle school for a while. Uh, we have been uh, applying every year for several years to uh, to get uh, support from the state uh, through their MSBA projects um, to call accelerated repair program, which is different than the one that the town of Amherst is getting for the school building. Um, and uh, you know we're we're in a group called Everyone because um, you know districts across the Commonwealth built schools like we did uh, in the in the late 60s and early 70s and so all of them have school roofs that need to be replaced at the same time so the 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 program and the funding source for msba funding uh is is kind of highest need first um and so you know each year that they sort of award projects like roof replacement uh, we tend to be sort of one year out of the cycle of cutoff for that um so we've been planning and working on that, and we have actually a debt authorization to to uh, which we'll we'll probably have to get a larger one in in a couple of years because a number number of years have passed and the costs have gone up. Um, um, so we've been we've been continuing to work in 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 submitting to that program and have not yet been successful. And uh, uh, last fall we did we did uh, take some of that debt authorization to do some some repair work on that roof. Um, uh, and yet it's you know it's not a complete repair by any stretch uh you know it, it is a bit of a whack-a-mole problem with a roof that's you know at that over 25 year old sort of place um i will say that the the you know the sort of weather event i mean we do have and have had for several years issues with regard to to the roof and 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 we have uh, a variety of ways we've tried to capture that water in in ways that are least harmful students and, and least disruptive to the educational program. However, uh, we had a circumstance the early part of the winter where you know we got three or four inches of snow and then it rained for two days. And so that's basically put a sponge on top of the roof and then fill it with water. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, if we'd had a new roof, we might have still had leaking problems in that circumstance. And that's not to diminish the need mm -hmm. is very great there. We've been trying to find a mechanism to get uh, our roof funded from MSBA. They cover roughly about half the cost, um, and uh, and we've also been waiting. And they put the program on pause during the pandemic for a year, and so that's delayed another year. So uh, we did submit again this year, um, you know, and we're hopeful for that. You know, if it degrades much further, we're going to have to 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 just cover the cost on our own and and figure out what that is. But it's going to cost all four towns twice as much and so when you look at our that you know that sort of last slide and you look at those out years where the numbers start to get really big really quick there's a number of projects like that uh that are in the mix there um so it's 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 a it's a real conundrum there are, there are um you know a variety of things talking about sort of strategizing to the future um and thinking about well how many students do we have and how do we structure ourselves and do we you know still maintain two buildings um you know the middle school building was built in 1969 the high school building has a uh, portion building from 55 part of the building from 64 and part of the building from 96 so the newest part of the building's you know pushing 30 years um roughly about half the building is from 96 renovation and then uh about 20 percent from the 50s and and 30 percent from the uh from the 60s and so all of that building needs some work as well and so do we look at different ways to structure um both the buildings and where we put the kids uh you know as part of the longer term planning and thinking about how to be most efficient with the number of kids we're going to have and the space we have and the infrastructure we have so all of those things are are simultaneously uh components we have to evaluate and, and think about in the coming years because any project of any significance um you know of a capital nature you know uh requires some real you know forethought and planning and 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 gathering of resources to cover it um, because, you know, uh, so an idea that we looked at a, a few years ago and, and then sort of, you know, was looking at whether or not, oh, well, if we get a little bit smaller, maybe we do a small addition at the high school building and put seven to 12 all in that sort of space. But that kind of stalled pretty quickly because once you make that level of addition to the building, you have to bring the remainder of the building up to code. And so the lowest in cost on that was over $30 million. And that was, you know, five years ago. So all of those are in the mix as we think about these kinds of things, and 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 we're endeavoring to to uh, to maintain those buildings as best we can, uh, and and strike that balance between you know uh, 
uh, leveraging state funding to help us out and just needing to do some of the work wholly on our own. And we're trying to find that right balance in, in doing that. Um, but it makes for challenging spaces for kids to be in. And that's unfortunate. Thank you for all sharing. Funds to do anything. Or the, the, the budget. I, I have it on. So ARPA, <clears throat> ARPA funds, I believe, could be used for that kind of repair. Thank you. Councillor Hannigan. Um, this question may be more for our town manager, but potentially also our acting superintendent. Um, negotiations with Amherst College for potential pilots have been ongoing for a number of years, and we have not received a lot of updates about those. But my question is specifically regarding funding for schools from Amherst College. Has Amherst College during those negotiations offered any specific amounts of funding specifically for either our elementary or regional schools or any capital projects related to them? And if so, what is the what was the town's response to the specific funding that may or may not have been offered? Uh, so currently is my understanding that the Amherst College provides about $85,000 a year, 75,000 goes to the region and about 10,000 goes to the elementary school. Um, they have discussed a slightly larger number um, over a long period of time which I've determined is well, well, well below what needs to happen from the college. Pat, did you have your hand up? Okay, seeing no more hands, I'm going to make a motion in accordance with, and seek a second, in accordance with charter section 5.5A, to refer the Amherst Pelham Regional School Budget to the Finance Committee for a public hearing and recommendation to the to the council within 30 days. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Andy. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? Seeing none, I'm going to begin with Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I. Councillor Haneke. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Did we lose her? About there. Okay. I'll come back and see. Uh, Pam Rooney? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Zhang? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Patty Angelus? Aye. And Councillor Lord. She's there, but she may have taken a break. All right. It's unanimous except for one councillor who is absent. Thank you. Uh, we are going to take a 10 minute break, which is long overdue. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for those of you that have hung out in the audience as long as you have. <laughs> um, Thank you all very much for taking it. Please uh, make sure you mute and also turn your picture off. Turn it back on when you come back. Thank 
Yeah, but I know I'm just wondering. So this is that
We need to reassemble. Thank you. Yeah. As you return, please put your video back on so I know you're back. I just want to make sure people are back. I'm s okay. You're back. All right. Um, the next item on our agenda is the Community Preservation Act appropriation for FY25. Before we begin, I'm calling on Jennifer Taub, and then I have a statement to make as well. Please go ahead, Jennifer. Um, yes, I just want to make the statement that uh, one of the applications for the CPA is from, to the CPA committee, is from the local historic district commission. And my husband is a member of that commission, but neither of us have any material interest in the application. So I don't feel I need to recuse myself, but I just wanted to share that bit of information. Thank you. In a very similar vein, my husband is on the group that has applied for the Mill River historic work. And uh, his name is on the application as one of the members. Again, neither he nor I have anything to gain from that. And so I see no reason why I can't continue to vote. Pat. I guess I need to say something about Carol. I guess you do. <laughs> That's what happens in small towns. We're all related. <laughs> My wife is one of the co-chairs of the uh, Amherst Community Housing Trust. and uh, But that is not affecting whether I vote to support it or not. Thank you. Are there any other confessions? <laughs> any other any other related complicated relationships? Please don't talk about them. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, this is, we're gonna start, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna place a motion on the floor, okay? And uh, that is in accordance with charter section, paragraph 5.6, I guess it's section 5.6, having been published on the town bulletin board for a minimum 10 days on February 23, 2024, a public forum held on March 18, 2024, and having been reviewed by the Finance Committee with a report on April 1, 2024, to adopt Council Order FY25 07A, an order appropriating the FY 2025 Community Preservation Act budget, as shown on page seven of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Thank you. Comments, Kathy. Yes, could you just show the motion that we're looking at? Because there was, there's one line that's been amended in the original a financial order, and I want to make sure we're. Yes, that's that's what I wanted to see. Thank you. I just want to make sure that's what we're voting on. It is. Okay. Are there any comments or questions? Yes. Point of point of order. Actually, if we if we the motion deleted the the twenty thousand dollars for the East Historic District. How would one reinsert that? You would have to make a motion to amend the motion. This is the motion at. Let me begin first of all by saying I'm going to ask the Finance Committee to comment, and then we'll go to the rest of the council. So, Bob. Yeah, we uh, we considered all of these um, projects, and we we actually the finance committee was was perfectly fine with this particular project, the twenty thousand dollar project. It was just there was some wording in the application itself that we've had problems with. So what we were proposing was that just to send it back to CPAC to get them to change the application. I don't know what the process is. For them to do that, but but only to to then have it come back to us, and then we would be prepared to uh, to approve it. So it, it's we don't have any problem with the project itself. It's just some of the wording, and it's in our report to the council. Some of the wording was um, such that we didn't want to uh, have that be establishing our positions on certain things that the council has its, its own positions on development and other issues. Um, the other thing is that in the original, in this order, it's uh, the name of the pro project is the East Amherst Local Historic District, and it's not a st study committee, which would, that, the, that word, it should be, it should read Local Historic District Study Committee. Uh, you know, we don't want to have this, you know, by de, de facto establish a district by by voting to approve this. So it's it, again, there's no issue with the project itself. It's just the language in the application and then how it was entitled on this order that we we objected to. I, I just want to acknowledge that Sam McLeod is in the is on Zoom with us. He is the chair of the CPA committee, and Sam, you. Um, raise your hand so I'm going to call on you and then go to the other counselors. Uh, 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 thank you, Lynn, and thank you all for all you do again. Um, I did watch the portion of the Finance Committee meeting. I am familiar with the applications. I thought it would be relevant for me to make a couple of comments regarding the project in question, which is the East Amherst Historic District uh, one point I wanted to make was that the report that our committee sent to Finance and the Town Council, uh, the names of the projects reflected the exact names that appeared in the applications that we received. That is to say that the specific name for this project application as submitted was East Amherst Local Historic District. Blank. 
uh, it was submitted by the East Amherst Local Historic District Study Committee. So the study committee was the organization that sit, submitted the request. The title of the request was East Amherst Local Historic District. Whether or not that would have been a desirable title to use for their project is a different question. Uh, if I were to have gone back to the time period where we created the descriptions uh, in conjunction with town staff that we sent to our committee, I probably would have placed adjacent to the title of their project in parentheses, the word study, so that it, their title as submitted, I might have made an asterisk amendment titling it East Amherst Local Historic District Study. Um, so that was one point I was going to make. Uh, and the other point I wanted to make was regarding um, the concept of the CPA making alterations to the applications. Um, we have a particular form that's utilized at present as a standard process that was open from September 1st through September 30th of 2023 that application is closed. Uh, so we as a committee don't have the capacity to alter the phraseology words or perhaps bad words, uh, un, you, know, uh, you know, editorializing words that might have been submitted as part of an application. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't know what our committee might do if something comes back to us. I would offer the, since you've asked me to, or been kind enough to let me speak with, I would suggest the following, uh, that the applicant could conceivably submit some comment seeking to retract it. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure logistically if our committee can address the existing application and change it, uh, or they could uh, resubmit again in the following cycle, which is in 20, uh, commences in September, most likely of 2025, this 2024, this summer. So I wanted to clarify the name of the application. Um, it reflects that title, even though it might be a misnomer. Uh, and secondly, I'm not sure what our committee uh, can do in terms of altering other than to have a discussion related to the application and possibly get a comment or a desired statement of retraction for the council. Those are my comments. So uh, thank, thank you, you for the opportunity to say my thoughts after having to listen to what was uh, discussed. Thank you. Uh, before I go any further, Pam Rooney, did we answer your question? Okay, um, Councilor Haneke. Um, yeah, I'm, I may raise my hand to speak on this matter particularly, but um, on the order that's on the motion sheet um, that has the red lined out and the numbers fixed under the appropriation order chart, the order itself in the paragraph above has a number that was not fixed. And so I don't know whether I need to make a motion to amend the... No line that says order to appropriate 1,855,136 to 1,835,136 at the very the second paragraph of the entire order that follows right after order. Um, if I need to make the motion, I will make the motion. Um, no, to I don't think you need to. I think we'll just make the correction. Um, Athena, thank you. Um, Anna. So I was a bit surprised that finance committee came out saying that they didn't want to recommend a project, even though they agreed with the project because of the wording in an application. And I want to be clear, I didn't appreciate the wording in the application either. For example, there are some things that I just felt were inaccurate. Uh, if, if we had quote unquote student hotels, we'd be getting more lodging tax money than we currently are. So that's just not true. Um, but I, I'd like to... I'd like to hear what the committee specifically recommends in terms of the the wording that they'd like to see, because it seems like my my understanding of our role is to approve projects, not 
direct wording and applications. And, you know, it feels like a slippery slope to sending back applications for, I'm being a bit dramatic, but sending back applications for typos, right? If we start wordsmithing applications, where is the limit that uh, there would need to be changes the council or council members find objectionable um, before it triggers that project not being taken under consideration? If people find the project objectionable or not in compliance with CPA law, it would make a lot more sense to me to strike it from the recommendations the council makes. But I, uh, this feels like a very slippery slope which leads me to two questions, which one is for Sam and one is for um, town staff, which is the first is Sam did this, uh, can, you, can you tell us if this conversation occurred in any sort of way when this project was, was being discussed at CPA? Uh, and then second is um, what would be town staff involvement with this project? And I apologize, I have read the application, but I don't have it up in front of me um, because I, again, I think that personal opinion does come in on any CPA proposal. People care about a project. That's their opinion that that project should be prioritized. I personally do find the language in this not something I necessarily agree with, but I agree with the, the what the money is funding. And for me, that is what we are um, voting as a council. So I'd love to hear if CPA did discuss this uh, specific issue as well and what town staff involvement would be with this project. Um, Paul, is this something David Zomek might speak to? Yes, David's also with us on Zoom. Um, David, would you unmute and perhaps speak to that? Sure, thanks, Lynn. Are you, are you talking specifically to what role, um, Councillor Devlin Gauthier's question about what role staff would play? Yes. Um, yeah, so with most CPA proposals, um, there would be staff support, as, as, as the council knows. Uh, so whether it's something related to recreation or planning or, you know, whatever category of affordable housing, there's always staff support. So staff would work closely on this um, uh, study of the East Village, you know, the historic structures. They would you know, if there was a consultant to be hired to do the work, they would work with our procurement officer, or excuse me, procurement office to, to hire that consultant, et cetera, et cetera. So there would be close, um, you know, close, um, you know, supervision and involvement by planning department staff. Nate Malloy is um, one of the folks that we often uh, lean on for these kinds of uh, projects, and he would be directly involved with this one. Is there any other question, Anna? No, I think that clarifies. I, th I think what I, the reason why I wanted to know was even if the initial application had um, a, a bias one way or another, or, or some of the applicants or one of the applicants did have um, an interest in doing this to a certain end, the fact that it's town staff that are deeply engaged in it who do not have a stance on the issues who are, who are seeking to do the historic preservation work um, without a stance on, on future development. For me, that again, leads me to trust that application in this project is deserving of CPA funding. Thank you. Jennifer. Um, yes. So I didn't, um, it was just maybe a half hour before the meeting that I read the finance committee report, uh, and saw that the word incursion had kind of raised a red flag. And so I just wanted to clarify because before I was on the council, I chaired, the local historic district commission and incursion is a historic preservation term and it's actually a term from the massachusetts historical commission it's in their handbook on local historic districts <clears throat> and a study you have to when you apply when you're just doing the study as the first step to even thinking about whether an area would be <clears throat> appropriate for local historic district designation the first thing you have to do is survey all the historic structures and document the history for them. And then now they're digitized. And I believe that the CPA committee thought it was important because the East Amherst, the area around the East Amherst Common is the oldest part of Amherst, that it would be worth 
the, the you know this small amount relatively small amount of funds to just have a digitized record of the history of all these 40 or more i think is what it is historic buildings and structures that are around and adjacent to the east commons to the east commons so that is really what this study it's it would has value in and of itself it's just the first step in applying to be for a local historic district designation. It would have to go through many steps. They have to survey the property owners in the area to see if they would be interested in having the designation. It comes back to the council and then it ultimately goes to the Massachusetts Historical Commission and they're the ones who ultimately accept the application. And they, in their instructions of how you um, sort of categorize buildings and structures in the area. Some are called incursions. It's almost like non-conforming structures, but it's not a pejorative term or a subjective term. And that's where that word comes from. So I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Mandy Jo. So I will address as a member of finance committee and the uh, uh, honest questions because I was the one that initially brought this forward and struggled with whether I could support the project based on the application. Because to me, supporting a project is also supporting the application. And the application I had extreme problems with, even though after speaking with the chair of the CPA committee, I understood the potential benefits of the act, getting the historic structures reports. But I had concerns about does supporting that mean we support a local historic district, the creation of a local historic district? It was not clear. And given the wording on all of this, it it implies if we're passing this, that there might even be a historic district. But my bigger concern was by supporting an, a project where the application says, quote, the construction of prefab shoddily built student hotels, which detract from and devalue the town and benefit only a handful of landlords is something I cannot support. And so I was not sure what to do about a project where an app, where I cannot support the wording in the application. And after speaking at finance, finance came through with this sort of solution of essentially asking the applicants to reapply with wording that is not so divisive, that is not necessarily accurate, and that frankly devalues more than half of our student, our population in town by the wording that it has. Um, and so, you know, the application also indicated that they were actually applying for this, or at least the historic district, because they're concerned about development and want to stop it. And that's another concern I have. Um, you know, they quoted, quote, rapid changes are occurring in the area, including a new school and a proposed adjacent overlay district that are impacting it, hit its historic character and integrity. Um, and, and as the finance report indicated, talked about the protections that a historic district potentially give to um, slowing or stopping redevelopment or development in an area. Um, so I couldn't, I, I, I had concerns that voting the project equates to supporting the application and the wording in the application is not something I can support. Jennifer, I'm gonna go over to Andy since you, he's not spoken, Andy. Yes. I would make a uh, suggestion and that what we probably should do is initiate an inquiry with the Department of Revenue Division of Local Services as to whether they would consider it appropriate uh, for the applicant and the CPA committee to agree on a modification of the language in the elimination of a sentence that is not central to the um, application itself or the merit of the application. And if we can get that kind of clearance, then I think that it would uh, it might make everybody comfortable to just um, 
change the application by eliminating the sentence and get it back for the end of the fiscal year, uh, which is what we want to do so that we can adopt it and have it be a budget item that can be where work can be done during um, FY25, which begins July 1st. And if DOR, Division of Local Services, comes in with an, un, with an answer that uh, we hope that they won't, but that says that you can't change an application, or they would object to our doing that even under the limited circumstances, then uh, we uh, still could uh, have the council make a decision as to whether or not it wants to fund it on the application is submitted. Um, I have a clarifying question, and I'm then I'm gonna, I'm gonna look to Paul and Dave Zomack, and that is, do we have to go to the state for that kind of a ruling? No, I don't think we need to go to the state. I think we can make a judgment. And I think the controlling document will be the contract that we enter into um, to expend the funds. So I think we can put in the contract whatever the council. We, we usually don't get into the detail of the application. We sign a contract with a consultant, say, to spend $20,000 to do the work to explore this um, this historic area. OK. Um, thank you. I, it didn't seem to me that this would require going back to the state, um, but I am going to trust your judgment on that. Um, Pat, go ahead. She She's spoken once, so I was going to give you a chance. Given, <laughs> I understand you can correct the language and then that makes it all okay and I can't support if this were here right now, not removed by the CPAC committee. I cannot support it. I mean, Mandy, you you stated some of the reasons. It's clearly designed this district, which is in my district and near where I live. Um, it, 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 <laughs> it 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 really is to stop development that we need. And the language is the true language of the people who are forming this committee. So you can change the sentence and make it sound better, but the goal of this particular group is the same. So I would not be able to support this uh, now or in the future. Jennifer? Um, yeah, so I wanted, first of all, in terms of development, uh, so I live in a local historic district um, we have had the library is in the district. <laughs> We're doing a major renovation and expansion. Uh, we built one of a the Sunset Fearing Townhouse development is in the local historic district commission before they did have to go before the commission to get a, a certificate of appropriateness, which they got. Um, they the project does look like it's contextually belongs in the general in the neighborhood, but there has been a lot of new development and building in a local in the local historic the uh, North Prospect Sunset Lincoln local historic district, um, the Emily Dickinson, the uh, Amherst Media building that is in the uh, Dickinson local historic district. Um, Destination Amherst is I mean people come to Amherst to visit our you know if they're if they're they have you know children that are visiting our colleges and universities and then parents come to visit them here. And the other reason people come to Amherst is our history. And there are a lot of buildings in this area. It may never become a local historic district, but there are a number of buildings from the 1700s. It's the oldest part of town, which we would do well to ensure are not taken down, that there, and it doesn't mean that you cannot have development. I mean, in the district, the East Street School it will, would be built there. Um, so they're it, pr trying to help Amherst retain its historic character, which I think is what Destination Amherst in large part is all about, is in no way pre precluded by having a local historic district. There is development and new building in local historic districts all the time. But um, you, it would be, Harder to take down, you know, the 1700. I'm forgetting the name of the tavern where uh, the bacon. Yeah, 
um, or the JCA building, but it in no in no way precludes new development or uh, expansion of currently existing structures. Anna. So um, the goal of the group can be what it is, but my question for, uh, I guess I'm gonna just put it out to the group and I, I, I think it might be Jennifer is the most experienced in this. Aren't the qualifications for determining whether something is historic or not and should be in this registry based on state or national standards. It's not something that this group gets to pick. Thank you. Jennifer is nodding for the record. So it's not something that this group is going to be determining qualifications that something will will then count as historic and can never be touched. Um, and, and I am supporting putting this back on the list for exactly the reason that was stated, which is that the governing document is not the application, but the contract that is entered into that the town is a part of and town staff are, are a part of. Um, historic protections don't prevent demolition of historic structures. M my house is a really prime example of this. I live in a really old house. No historian is going to fight me if I said I wanted to knock it down because it's just not, it's a cute little spot, but it is not going to be, you know, in the history books here. So um, I think that I, I'd like to hear, I, I would like to hear from, I think Dave maybe, about the benefits or drawbacks to this from a town perspective um, without agenda for development or non-development. But I, if, if you're able to do that, Dave, I'd, I'd like to hear it, or Paul, um, I'd love to hear that. But I just, again, this group isn't going to get to decide whether something's historic or not. That's, that's not what this group gets to do, no matter who's in the group. Um, I'm gonna call on the town manager. Thank you. Um, so many of you may know that I previously had worked at the Cambridge Historical Commission, which is a local historic preservation commission. I walked through this area a lot, and I'm a, I think that this area needs to be examined. It's the historic center of the town of Amherst. There are a lot of um, buildings built in the 1700s and early 1800s in that area that are um, constructively being demolished because they're not being maintained. This this so I think that the town should be proactive in looking at this area. And that's what this is a very, very, very first step is to examine the buildings that are in that dis in that area. Ultimately, it could become a histor local historic district. That's again, a vote of the council to even begin that process in terms of establishing a, a if we're gonna do a local historic district, a local historic district study committee. And there are rules about who has to serve on such a committee. Um, so I think that um, I, I totally understand the, um, the concern about the language. Historic preservation, it should not be used as a tool to prevent development, but um, there are every historic district commission, every historical district has what they call intrusions. Um, uh, in, in national register districts, they're called contributing or non-contributing buildings. Um, so, and those are generally just exempt from regulation in that situation. So, um, but the goal of this is to uh, look at the assemblage of buildings that are in that geographical area and pro provide a modicum of uh, pre preservation for them. But this isn't even there yet. We're just saying like, what's there? That's what this money will do is like inventory the buildings to a sur survey of architectural history on this area and see what's there and see if it's, if there's enough evidence, historical evidence there to support the next step, which would be to establish a study committee. David, you had your hand up. I gather you don't feel you have anything you need to add at this time. The only thing I would add, Lynn, and Paul said it very well just moments ago, um, you know, that staff is, is squarely behind the proposal for the assessment for the study of the buildings. Um, it's unfortunate that some of the, the, the language in the proposal has, has um, you know, um, you know uh, ended us here, here tonight and, and brought us to this, this point. But essentially, this is really just, this is a study of the building, of the architecture, of the history of these buildings, the land, you know, how we ended up with the land use and the the uh, the buildings in the configuration they're in in this village center, and that's will lead to other work in in this long process. So um, staff is squarely behind the study itself, and as Paul said, the contract will determine the scope of the work, 
for the consultant. George. So just to clarify, if that's possible, um, if this motion goes ahead, this particular item is going back to CPA and then they're going to go back to the sponsors to see if they'll change the language. And then it will then come back to us for a vote. Is that at the moment where we stand? That would be the, that it, at the moment, that is where we would have to stand because the way the motion is, it excludes this project. If we were to put this back in, since what we're hearing from staff and from a number of other speakers, is that there is general support for this in spite of its intemperate language, then it would just go ahead. Could we make a motion to, I would like to make a motion to reinsert this item back into the um, original motion and have it go ahead as it originally was presented to us. Could I do that? Yes, you can. Uh, Athena, is there any particular way you want that motion worded? Not the way I said it, I know. It would be a motion to amend to change the appropriation amount to 1855136 to reinsert the East Amherst Local Historic District under historic preservation in the amount of $20,000 uh, with a funding source of CPA UDFB and to change the less projects recommended above to $1,855,136 and the remaining UDFB for debt service to be voted in the general fund, $520,250. George? So moved. Is there a second? Second by Rooney, who would, replace, would be glad to replace her original second. Thank you. May I speak to the motion? Please. I understand that some people are offended by the language. I too am offended by the language, but I think it's really not the point here. Um, this is a good thing, it should be done. Staff sees that it should be done. Um, and what really, as Anna pointed out, what matters is the contractual language. So I think we should just go ahead and I hope you'll support uh, the amended motion. Are there any other comments at this time? Okay, is there anybody that, Kathy. I'll just make a quick comment because I was on the finance committee. I support what George has just said, and particularly the fact that staff will be writing a contract. Um, I think it doesn't matter what the original proposal wording was, that there is a body of work to be done and there's a need for it to be done. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Yeah. Yes. Pat? I'm going to quote Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty said, when I use a word, it means exactly what I choose it to mean, nothing more and nothing less. And those words uh, carry meaning and intention that I think is inappropriate. Are there any other comments? There's an amendment on the floor. The amendment's been made and seconded. The amendment would restore this project to the financial order. I'm not going to go through the detailed wording of the amendment. I'm going to leave that to the uh, clerk of the council. Are there any other comments? Okay, we're going to vote on the amendment. And after that, come back to the original motion. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke. No. Bob Hagner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Councillor Lord. Okay, I'm going to say absent. Uh, Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Um, Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. It passes unanimously. No. Uh, not. I'm sorry. It <laughs> passes. 10 in favor, two I, opposed, and one absent. Thank you. 10 in favor, two opposed, and one absent. Um, I didn't, I'm sorry about the unanimous. Now we are back to the original motion. Um, and 
I have my hand up. Yes. I would ask that we um, split out that particular project from the original motion. That we pull it out from the original motion. So that it's two votes. Okay. So that the original motion is going to be to pass the financial order the way it is present, and then we're going to vote separately on the financial or on a uh, motion to, yes. Point of order. To, you, you want to split the motion. Why? Sorry. It's a I, motion to divide. Is that It's possible? a motion to divide. Yes. So Mandy is making a motion that we will then vote on? Yes. Divide. She's making a motion to divide. Thank you. Is I, I don't think we need a second and a vote to divide. Okay. Thank you. That's what I was exactly what I wanted. But we, but we need to know which part the council will vote first. Okay. Um, uh, Mandy Jo, did you have your hand up? You made you you so, wanted to. So yeah, divide. I'm asking to divide out the East Amherst Local Historic right. District line. From I understood. Yeah. Do you want to do you want the council to vote on that one line first or the yes. rest of the funding first? Yes. So Go line. ahead and vote on that line yep. first. Do you have a motion for that one? Point of no. order. I, I really say point of order, but don't we have um an amended financial order on the table? Don't we we do have an amended now we're going to have to vote on whether we whether or not we want to divide. Right. We have a we have a financial order amended financial order on the table. The request has been made to divide that financial order into two votes. And are we going to vote on that motion? Ugh. No, we do not have to vote on. According to Athena, we don't have to have a second or to vote on the motion to divide. Not on a motion to divide. So. It's basically a request to it's divide. Request. Um, so the council can vote the appropriation, the order without the East Amherst Historic District, and then it would be another vote on the East Amherst Historic District. I'd need a minute to change the order to have two separate orders um, if you want to do it that way, or you could just vote and I'll create two separate orders afterwards. Let's do it that way, please. Okay. So do you want do you let's want do the, the first one on the East Amherst historic to dis, local historic district? Point of order. I don't know what we're voting on. Okay. The, we voted first of all. We did vote the amendment. The amendment put that back into the financial order. Then Councillor Haneke has requested that we divide the vote on the financial order into two votes. One is a vote for the East Amherst Local Historic District by itself, and the other is for everything else. Okay, but the original <laughs> it's order was amended. That, that, that there's a motion to right. for the mo amended version of the order correct to be divided the current order that's in front of the council that's on the floor the motion that's on the floor is a motion to adopt the order appropriating the community preservation act budget with the east amherst local historic district line because that was the amendment was to add it back to the order that's what's in front of you now councilor haneke has requested that those things be separated and the council vote on everything but the east amherst historic district and then the east amherst historic district line as a separate motion thank you so I there's understand. a motion on the floor that we're going to take as two separate motions okay and Do, so we, is, are there other questions george you have your hand up i don't think so okay so let's vote on the East Amherst Local Historic District line first. Can we take 30 seconds and just make sure we're all on the same page? Yes. <laughs> and I just want to register when I checked a motion to divide should be voted on when I just looked at the general rules out there, but I'm willing to do this for the purpose of time. I, but okay. I, I, frankly, Kathy, I thought a motion to divide had to be seconded and voted on. And, but. 
and just so everyone knows, in our packet, we have the original financial order. Right. You know, not just the one with the strikeout. So, right. okay, I'm willing to do it because I want to move on, but I, this thank is you. crazy. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes. Okay. Yes, George. Sorry. As I understand, a motion to divide is a courtesy to another counselor. So I think that's why it's probably not debatable. Um, so it's just a courtesy. If someone asks to divide the motion, as a courtesy, you allow them to do that. The motions are still before you to vote on, but as a courtesy, you do that. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to with this time we are voting on only that line item of the financial order, okay? Yes, the East Amherst Local Historic District in Prince Study Committee. Okay, Lynn Griesmer is an I. Councilor Haneke. No. Bob Hegner. I. Councilor Lord. Absent. Uh, Pam Rooney. Aye. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. The vote is 10 in favor, two opposed, one absent. We go back. And now we are voting on all the rest of the financial order. Okay. Any questions? George. Your hand is still up. <laughs> all right. This time we're going to begin with Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Ford. Absent. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. And I think I made it through all. It is 12 people in favor and one person absent. We are going to move on to the bylaw 350 rental registration bylaw regulations and fee schedule. This is a first reading. We will if, if possibly vote next week on the 8th. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I'm now calling on CRC Chair Pam Rooney. A point of order. I, I just want to note that there was a motion on the sheet that's a moot point now that the Finance Committee had recommended. We didn't speak to that, but I'm assuming that the Council doesn't want to take up that motion. I'm sorry, what? The Council had recommended that the uh, community, that the Council requests the Community Preservation Act Committee work with the East Amherst Local Historic District applicant. There's a motion on the sheet for that. I'm saying that it's moot and we're moving on. Just wanted to make a note of Thank that you. because you're not voting on it. I just looked down and saw the motion. Thank you. All right. We're moving on to 3.50 rental red, rent, reg, residential renter bylaw regulations and fee schedule. And I'm going to call on CRC Chair Pam Rooney. We also have, um, I don't even know if he's going to still join us. Um, Bob Mora is available at some point, but David Zomack is also with us. Um, Pam. Thank you. And can you hear me without punching over my thing? Okay. We can hear you. Uh, before I even start, and thank you for putting this up, can you share screens with? so I can actually see it. Thank you. Great, thank you. I do want to re, um, respect and thank the members of the CRC starting in 2022 and the members of the community who have waited on this essentially since day one. And I, I see one in the audience. Um, and I do want to thank Tom Crossman for being a devoted follower of this topic. So. Starting out, residential rental property bylaw 3.50. This is an update coming from the Community Resource Committee. It is our first reading. Next slide. 
back in 2023, town meeting adopted a rental registration bylaw. There was previously no tracking of rental units. The permit was uh, required, but it was a voluntary self-certification for health and safety compliance. Over uh, Since 2023, we have seen increasing numbers of especially single family homes converting to rentals. The number of permits, however, started to drop, indicating non-compliance. The program itself was primarily complaint driven. So at the start of the 2022 council term, four councilors sponsored the update of this bylaw. Town council referred the task to CRC on March 21, 2022. Thank you. Next slide. The goals that were identified uh, by the by the CRC as and and the councilors sponsoring as we began to put it together were a to protect the health, safety, and welfare of residents, implement a proactive inspection program instead of relying on self-certification of compliance. Monitor and enhance compliance for basic life safety through the licensing. Also provide clear and accessible guidelines for the operation of rental properties for tenants, owners, landlords, and neighbors. Ensure awareness of and responsibility for other related town bylaws and to identify rental units on an ongoing basis. Next slide. What will the update require? So it's a very complex bylaw. It's fairly extensive. But in essence, what will it require is that all rental units get a permit from the town or face a penalty. The exemptions are hotels, motels, and group homes. Contact information for all owners and local management is required. The management plans, such as trash, parking, maintenance of grounds, would be required rather than self-certifying that these would be met. Today, we do not have, we do not have many situations with management plans. Um, once in a five-year inspection for health, fire, building codes, and added town bylaws, rather than complaint-driven or emergencies only. Tenant information sheets, which do occur now, but with key local regulations, reminders of bylaws, including noise, alcohol, and nuisance, and reflection of state laws and codes that apply to rental properties. Also, an, a comprehensive appeal process was created. Next slide. Lots of public outreach and engagement. I want to thank Shalini Balmilne at this point for her survey that she put together that went through Engage Amherst. But the community forums occurred in July and October 2022 they engaged a, a good number of tenants, neighbors, and large and small management businesses. Uh, the Engage Amherst survey was also well utilized. It included people that signed up as tenants or identified as tenants, as managers, and as neighbors. We did receive a letter of concern from the Landlord Association, especially regarding the inspection requirement. As a result, we had another session, owner-manager work session in February 2024, and made some changes as a, as a result of that. We also got ongoing public comments in regular meetings. Next slide. The process was long. Um, we started out reviewing other Massachusetts college communities where bylaws and inspection programs existed, namely, uh, or including Salem, Boston, and Lowell. We engaged with the building commissioner and senior inspector on a, on a, on a constant basis, um, reviewing and understanding current and potential practices. 
it's, we separated out nuisance bylaw concerns to update in a parallel track. So that is not linked specifically to the rental pro bylaw. Uh, it, it went through legal review, GOL review, and that input was addressed in text changes. There is consideration of fee structure that went to finance committee and again uh, came back to CRC. And finally, the, um, the proposed implementation plan and final text reflected the input of that imp implementation plan. Next slide. The fee structure tried to keep the fees lowest possible and for the largest number of units, which is primarily the single family units, um, but still cover the cost um, by using about two thirds of the uh, special strategic partnership agreement funds that came from UMass for this purpose. Uh, the owner occupied parcels would remain at $100 a year all other parcels at 150 a year plus 100 per additional unit up to a max of just over $1,000 per parcel. And a parcel could have 40 units on it. It could have 10 units on it. Um, but again, this is a per parcel permit. Inspections we set at $150 per unit. Next slide. I don't know if I don't know if Rob Mora is in the audience at this point. I was going to pass this over. There he is, magically appeared. Uh, I would like to introduce Rob Mora, who was um, extremely helpful in helping formulate and and um, formulate this this bylaw. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Rob Mora, Building Commissioner. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about an implementation plan uh, should the council uh, adopt this bylaw and it and go into effect later in April. Um, this is a uh, inspection program that is uh, accomplished over a five-year period, but what I'm going to describe to you right now is a six-year implementation uh, for that first year being uh, a way to roll out the program and phase into a fully functioning program, fully staffed program. Uh, and, and as mentioned, uh, the strategic partnership agreement uh, dedicated uh, $100,000 for supporting safe and healthy neighborhoods. Uh, the town manager has committed uh, those funds to support this program should it move forward. And what we would uh, look to do is uh, start immediately by hiring one of the uh, needed inspector positions uh, to move the program forward uh, this spring into summer and start to develop the program. And, you know, what that means is uh, preparing the uh, inspection checklists, uh, building out the electronic uh, open gov system that we use for tracking our, our permit and licenses, uh, outreach to the owners of the properties uh, and, and education uh, as much as we can to prepare for what uh, the inspection program would look like with the, the intent of starting some inspections in early uh, 25 uh, to, to get things moving, to start to work out any issues and uh, build that system uh, for a fully fully scheduled uh, inspection program uh, starting in July of 25. Uh, so what that will allow us to do is not have to hire all the needed positions all at one time. Uh, we would uh, look to bring in our second inspector just before going into that full first year. Uh, so a year from July, uh, we would be ready for that. So leading up to that, that you know, being prepared for that time, we would bring in the, the rest of the staff. And the goal would be to um, complete the first five-year inspections in, inspection cycle by July of 3030, uh, 2030. Thank you. Okay. We're open to questions and again, want to thank the CRC for 
spending this kind of time to the town inspection department for the support and to Shalini Balmilne for our outreach efforts. I will add here, thanks to the community for contributing input and guidance. I might also mention that I believe this is the third time this has come to the council. The other two times it was referred back to CRC with a lot of work has been done along the way. So um, thanks to some counselors that are no longer even on the council, as well as the counselors who are on the council. Uh, George, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, it seemed that during the near the end of the process, some concerns were raised by local landlords. And if I read that timeline right, there was a further meeting and I'm wondering what, if any, changes were made to the bylaw to meet those concerns. Can I respond? I'm sorry, go ahead, Payne. One of the key elements that changed, and anyone can correct me if, if you wanna add more. Uh, one of the uh, elements that changed is that um, we decoupled the nuisance bylaw and the um, having three uh, violations of a nuisance bylaw actually disallow someone, potentially disallow someone from getting a permit um, to, to rent the building. Um, I'm gonna look at other people um, across the room and or Rob Mora for further Rob has his hand up. Rob? Uh, a couple uh, additional items that we finalized in the last uh, versions uh, this earlier this year uh, following those discussions included uh, a reduction in the number of units that would be inspected in the large complexes from 20% to 10%. Uh, so um, properties that have 10 or more units will have uh, up to 10% of their uh, total units inspected rather than 20%, which was an, an earlier version of the, the document. Um, we also um, had decided that uh, certain properties that undergo inspection either by their uh, mortgagee or insurance requirements that are uh, conducted uh, perhaps by a federal program inspector uh, could satisfy the inspection requirements as long as those have been done within the five years and we would uh, we would allow the uh, the owners of the properties to submit that information and, and request the waiver of the inspection for those reasons thank you Mandy Jo, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, um, in short, anything in the tracked changes marked up version that is marked up is what was changed in response from December to that. So so that's why there's a track changes version. Um, it can show you what was changed. But the other thing I would add is within the bylaw itself, um, I think it's the bylaw, but it might be, no, it, it under the consent section, there was a tenant authorization section added um, that the tenant may specifically um, deny access to the dwelling unit um, for the, that inspection and and how that is done and what and whether a, wh whether and what permit is issued if the tenant specifically denies access for that required inspection. So that was also a, one of the big specific things response, responsive to the landlord concerns. George? So a tenant may deny access. The property still will be inspected, but not that particular unit. Is that, am I understanding that basically? So it, it gives the tenant a certain right, but the building still, or another unit of the building will be inspected. Or Unless they, there isn't another yeah, unit. Yeah, exactly. There could be. Yeah. And that, that's, just, that's just too bad. Right. And one of the questions I, I might, a very broad one, and um, but it sounds like someone can lose a landlord or someone who is renting in Amherst can lose their right to do that under certain circumstances, correct? I mean, there's many, many ways to remedy it. 
and they're spelled out in the in the bylaw. But it is possible that at some point all the remedies have been exhausted and you just won't be able to uh, do business in this town. Is that for that property? So specific to the property doesn't mean you may own other property and so you could still those property. But for that particular property, I'm just kind of trying to get a handle on what is there like a um, a death penalty here, so to speak, um, or no? Pam, um, I would say we, there is a process for um, for correcting the problems, and there is a there is a, a reinspection process for doing just that. Timelines are given. And um, I would say it's probably extremely rare that there, that there would ever be a shutdown unless the building was in such deplorable condition that it should not be in, inhabited. And I think that's, the town staff works very hard to, um, to accommodate and, and um, bring along even reluctant land, landlords um, but to correct the actions. And that's the process that is described. And if if all else fails and something is closed down, there is also an appeal process, which didn't really exist before either. And and George, just to be clear, it's by property. It's not by, okay, thank you. Any other questions, George? No, uh, Bob Hagner. Yeah, I have two questions on timing and time related. The first is, Will the 100,000, will any other town funds be required to, for startup? Or will the $100,000 plus the new fees, rental fees, uh, registration fees cover the, the program from the start? And then after the five years, when the $100,000 sunsets, will we need to raise the inspection fees? And if so, will that require a change in the bylaw? Okay, um, Rob or Paul? Rob, maybe you want to go with that one? Sure. Um, so for for startup, uh, there's no additional funds needed other than uh, the $100,000, uh, a portion of the $100,000 and the anticipated fees that will be collected. Uh, the, the program is designed to run off, uh, based on the fees for the annual permit, the inspections, and about two thirds of that $100,000 um, strategic partnership money. Uh, after the five years is up, uh, then we have to find a way to fund that. Uh, so if, uh, if the town manager has any comment on that now, if not, you know that is something that will have to be looked at in the future, whether it's raising fees or some other uh, funding source. Uh, but, but if if we wanted to change the fees, we would have to revise the bylaw. No, no, no. no. Uh, Pam Rooney, uh, we would not have to. We have regulations, and as proposed now, this would go to board of licenses, a license licensure, and they would, as we have adjusted other fees in town over the last couple of years, they would have the responsibility to keep the, the program going if it if it's working um it's it's the board of license commissioners thank you okay alicia um thank you i have a couple of questions um first sort of just picking up on george's question um about when the when it comes time for inspection how notification will happen to a tenant so will it just be like your unit is being inspected on this day or will they have some sort of choice? So for example, if they showed up at a tenant's door and a tenant is refusing, maybe because this is not a good day, as opposed to, I don't ever want my unit inspected. Is there an opportunity for that to be rescheduled at a time that works better for the tenant? Or is that possible to be coordinated beforehand so that doesn't occur? Rob, do you want to answer those? Yes, uh, we anticipate the scheduling of inspections will happen pretty far in advance. Uh, so it'll be a known schedule. 
it will be the responsibility of the owner or, or property manager to coordinate and give notice to the tenant. And I would expect um, we'll be prepared for, uh, you know, all kinds of things to happen, including uh, uh, being, uh, you know, showing up to a property to conduct an inspection and perhaps a unit, uh, a tenant of a unit for whatever reason does not want to have us in there that day. We can schedule, uh, we can put it into a different uh, cycle for another year if it's uh, a tenant that just doesn't want to have the unit inspected. So we will have, um, you know, we'll have protocols in place to deal with uh, all of those situations. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just have one more question and one comment. Um, my next question is, is there any way to prevent or monitor landlords from passing down the expense of the fee by increasing rent? Anybody want to take that one on? I'm going to answer that I, I don't know that we have that capability, right? Okay. Alicia. Um, so yeah, I just, I think that that is a concern for some tenants. And so I've had some communication from tenants who have received, in their opinion, confusing communication about what implications exist for this specific bylaw. Um, and I've been reached out to by a number of tenants who have received communication directly from their landlord that tells them this bylaw is going to do things that it's not actually going to do. Um, and I think tenants, some are, you know, for lack of a better word, freaking out about it. Um, and so I am hoping that we can find uh, another way to do some more robust outreach because people are concerned that their rent is going to go up. People are being told that they're going to have no choice as to whether or not uh, their unit can be inspected. And they're also being told that, you know, uh, town staff will be able to come and inspect your unit whenever they want. And tenants should go to the town council meeting and tell them no. Um, and so people are really worried about this. And so I'm hoping we can get some more clear information out to tenants as to what the actual implications are. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor <laughs> Walker. Um, Kathy? First, I want to say I appreciate how long many of you on CRC have worked on this. Um, and my concern from the beginning, because um, I was almost an initial sponsor, but what I was sponsoring is trying to focus on nuisance houses, um, problem houses. So I'm somewhat worried that we are setting up a small bureaucracy to go after all rental units in town when there are, and, I, and as Rob has said, we don't know how many are a problem in terms of falling apart, the slumlord side. So I, I would have preferred to start with a nuisance law that said, if you have a couple complaints against you, it triggers an inspection. So we started the inspection by, not by complaint, by triggering. So I am still worried about that, and I am still worried about the financing of it. So Bob's question was, you know, will we cover it? So I think we need to have a periodic assessment on what is it we're actually doing with this. Um, I, I've looked at, I actually pulled a lot of these different laws, and Burlington has a pretty extensive inspection system with a lot of inspectors, and uh, Purely anecdotally, I have a nephew who was living in an abysmal apartment. So it didn't, net, you know, with plumbing didn't work, lights didn't work, et cetera. So it didn't necessarily solve the problems. It may solve some of the nuisance problems. So I think we're trying to go after the houses, two kinds of houses. One is they're perpetually a problem in the neighborhood. Another is if you get inside them, they're a danger to the people who are living there. You know, they're, we've got slumlords. And sometimes you can tell from the outside of the house that probably things are deteriorating. So I I continue to be worried that it's not as well targeted as it, as it could be. I do like that we change 
it, the sampling for the really big apartment buildings that we're not going after as many units. And you have the right to sample more if it turns out that you're finding some problems for the non-owner occupied but small landlords that have three or four units, the permit fee will be higher than the current fee is 250. So if you have four units, you're gonna be considerably higher. So Alicia's concern about some of this will show up as rent. We don't have rent control in the state or in our town. So to the extent it gets passed on it will get passed on. So I, I just think we should all realize what we're doing here. We are, um, uh, above all, I don't want it to be a financial drain on our operating costs. We're really short of funds for a lot of essential services. So I wanna know it fully pays for itself for at least five years, and then we take a look at it. So that's my concern. It's been my concern from the beginning. I still, I know we, we said we are, we're waiving, if you're already being inspected by federal or state um, and you show that you had an inspection, the wording still doesn't say there is an exemption. It says may exempt or may, may inspect. I've always wanted to move that into the exemption. And I know that the reason CRC didn't is that Rob made strong arguments why it should be left worded. I can't see why we would inspect places that are federally or state inspected. So I just wanna lower the number we inspect, not increase. So that May wording is in I1B1. And the, the those properties are not listed under the exemption category. So it's, it's just one section of where it could get moved to a straight exemption. So I will stop there. I do think there were improvements in the fee structure and in the sampling to make it less onerous than when we first saw it. So thank you very much. George. I guess this is for Rob. Um, is there a need to be worried about compliance? In other words, uh, one of the points made earlier in the meeting was that one of the motives behind, the, behind this was that the number of permit, permits seemed to be declining and hence people were not actually participating in the program. Now, everyone um, is, who rents is going to be expected. Um, should we be concerned about compliance? Is that, and what can we do about it to ensure that everyone who rents a property actually has a permit? Rob or Jennifer, did you so, want to try to answer that? No, I have another question. Okay, huh. Rob, thank you. Um, you know, one important thing that's happened in the last two years is that we've, uh, we've, uh, purchased and implemented a uh, permitting and licensing program that gives us the ability to really monitor, uh, you know, who's receiving licenses and the renewal process and uh, get that information really quickly. And we weren't able to do that before under the older, old system that was put together really quickly at the start of this program. Uh, and, and we never were able to um, enhance that until very recently. So last year we went through and did a did a check as we were working on this bylaw on, on for compliance, and we did find I, I, off the top of my head it was 110 or 120 properties that were that should have been permitted that were not permitted. Uh, so I think we've straightened that out. Uh, so we have gotten those those properties uh, licensed again. And I think going forward, we'll be able to monitor those and we have a better system to coordinate with the assessor's office and we monitor transfers of properties. So I think all of these things with uh, staff. So right now we have one individual uh, from the beginning in 2013 that did all of this and, you, and as much of it as uh, could be done at any time, but I think with all of these pieces together, uh, there'll be a lot less of that non-compliance. Okay. Jennifer? Uh, yeah, I just want to respond because Alyssa, um, Alicia raised a really important point, which may be via our own, if and when this should, um, you know, the council would vote to approve it, um, that maybe between all the counselors in our mailing list, we could, you know, maybe somebody could even one of the committees i don't know if it would be town services um, and outreach to 
you know, draft a summary mm -hmm. and details of what this uh, bylaw entails so that that could be disseminated to residents um, so that they would have accurate information about the program. Thank you, Jennifer. I would appreciate that as a district counselor. Um, are there any other questions or comments? We're not voting tonight. We are, this will be back on the agenda for the second reading in our vote next week. At that point, we'll vote on the bylaw, the regulations, and the fees. Okay, seeing none, we're going to move quickly on. Um, Anna, are you with us? Thank oh, you. Oh, always. I know you were. I just um, wanted to respectful. Um, the next uh, item is a proposed change, mi minor change, I might say, in the um, uh, Charter Review Committee charge. And I'm going to make the motion, Anna, maybe you want to second it, to amend the 2024 Charter Review Committee charge by striking nine in the number of voting members and replace it with seven and striking nine residents in the composition section and replacing it with seven residents. Is there a second, Anna? Yeah, I'll second it. And you'll go ahead and talk about GOL. I will, and I'm sorry I'm not there in person. I'm not feeling well, and I didn't want to subject you all to me not feeling well. So uh, I appreciate the patience with, with letting me zoom in. Um, so this came, and I also want to apologize, the second apology is um, that this is not a written report and in the future you will have written reports. So I appreciate the grace in, in hearing from me right now. Um, GOL has now for several weeks been unable to find the pool for the Charter Review Committee to be sufficient. There is not necessarily a specific formula, um, a specific number we are seeking. However, based on the app, the CAFs that we have received, the community uh, activity forms we have received, we have not as a committee been able to um, make that vote and, and um, even hold the vote. No motion has been made. Um, so part of this discussion in our last GOL meeting was, you know, what do we need to do in order to let this committee get their work started? Because they have a lot of work to do. Um, and uh, Councillor Ryan suggested possibly reducing the number of members to seven. Um, and, and the discussion really centered on nine is a bit of an arbitrary number. Um, there was concern. This was not a unanimous decision from the committee. And I wanted to just bring up some of our concerns. And I also will uh, welcome any other members of GOL who want to add any thoughts. But the concerns with lowering the number include um, melt rate. So we looked at other committees that had um, seen a drop off in, in membership as they went along, as well as concern regarding uh, community representation on the committee. Um, the, the committee was divided, but our consensus was really that we wanted the council to have this discussion. Um, obviously the council would be the one to make the decision. And you know, while every committee member on GOL wasn't set on seven, we, we wanted to bring this to you all um, to, to talk about it and see if, if the council thinks that dropping the number to seven would allow us to get the work done and would result in a, um, a committee that is, meets the selection criteria that we have established. I think I'll leave it there. If there's anything that GOL members would like to add, I welcome that as well. Kathy? Oh, wait, sorry. Can we can we go to George first as a GOL member? I'm sorry, add? George. Uh, yes. Sorry, Absolutely. sorry, Kathy. George. Yeah, I think we've really struggled to uh, to get to the point where we can declare the pool sufficient. Um, and I thought this might be a way that we could get there. I think seven is perfectly decent number. Um, it would certainly be able to, I think, staff and get a good body. Um, we're struggling with nine. I, I think we should have at least twice as many applicants and we're not anywhere close, at least at the moment. I haven't seen the latest numbers, but we're not close to 18. Um, so I felt that by reducing it by two, um, we would be able to move forward um, and we could we could put seven solid individuals on that body. If you want to keep it at nine, um, we're still gonna have to keep looking for bodies, I think, because um, I don't think we're, we don't have enough to make that decision. 
Yeah, I'm going to go to Councillor Ette, who's also on GOL. So seven is a beautiful number, but uh, nine is no less beautiful than seven. Um, I supported the decision to bring this to the council, even though I would prefer nine. The reason being that that provides a greater variety of people who could serve um, in that role. Um, and in speaking and discussing this issue, I think that provides an opportunity for members in town to, be, to, to know of the need that we have and perhaps that deficit can be covered. But in any case, I think nine just provides a bit more variety than seven does. Kathy Shane. Uh, as far as I can see, and I went this morning to count all the CAFs, we have 16 and um, I may be off in terms of I might have missed one, but I did find 16. So 16 is a pretty healthy number to come to then get to nine. Um, and I, I can see why if you've got one slot open, you would like to have two people <laughs> applying. But when we're getting to really big numbers, I'm not sure your ratio, George, is as important. You know, so two slots open is probably a good idea to have four people. But but I wouldn't keep that math going upwards. You know, can, you can imagine the elementary school building committee. We have 13 people to say that could only do it if we had 26. So I'm not sure I see a strong rationale for reducing it. And I do think one of the advantages of this charter review commission is more people will know what's in the charter and they will also become familiar. There's a limited number of things that can be changed right now. And so that knowledge of what can be changed and what is not being driven by the charter per se, you know, if there's some council procedure that people aren't like, it's not driven by the charter, it's just driven by other things, you know, on. So I, I think having nine people get that depth of understanding is a very, is a very healthy um, thing to happen in our town, what, six years into this new government, you know, what's in it um, and what can be changed. So nine also multiply that by each of them is talking to three, four or five people. They're not alone. So that also increases the depth of people who are thinking about this. Can I, Cameron? Sorry, can I step really? Yes, really? please. Um, um, we're currently by, I counted right before this meeting at 15, we did have one person withdraw their application. Um, and the committee looks beyond just strictly numbers. Um, we have a set of selection criteria. And so they also, the committee discussed looking at um, the other uh, identifiable factors from the CAF, including age, gender identity, uh, race, ethnicity, and um, address. Okay. Pam? I think I would say almost exactly what Kathy just said. If, if we had that percentage of people uh, available for ZBA consideration, I would be giddy. And I think um, of the of the CAFs, I, I also had tallied up about six, 16 um, and was really puzzled why that didn't seem like a sufficient pool. Uh, I appreciate the, the comment that uh, this does in fact give us a broader diversity um, from within the community. I've looked at all the people that, that put their names in and they come with a vast array of background and experience. So I would, I would encourage you to keep it at nine and move forward ASAP. Mandy Joe. So I was concerned that nine was too big when we passed this charge about a year ago. Um, and I think we're seeing that maybe that concern valid. Um, I understand the comments that 15 or 16 for nine positions is plenty. Um, but in my four years of chairing CRC, um, there were many times where CRC voted a pool sufficient for 
two, three, or four openings in ZBA or planning board because at the time the pool included just CAFs and that pool included for say three openings, six, seven, or eight people, or even just six or five. And we said, well, we've got more. But then when it came time for people to actually submit a statement of interest and go through an interview, that number that went from submitting CAFs and saying I'm interested to actually submitting a statement of interest and sitting for an interview dropped. And so if you start with 15 and you're seeking to fill nine spots, you might only end up with 12, 11, or 10. Um, and that's when it becomes very difficult to say then the pool is sufficient, but there really isn't another opportunity to say whether the pool is sufficient or not at that time. You can, but it gets more difficult because at that time, you've already released names of who's applied. And so it is taken, if you're saying now that the pool is not sufficient, a lot of times the public sees that and says, well, you're saying that because you don't like who. Um, and so I, I'm going to support the move down to seven because I would be, I, I'll, I'll be pleasantly surprised if the 15 people who have submitted CAFs all submit SOIs and go through the interview. I will be thrilled, but my guess is that won't happen. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I just don't want to take a lot of time, but I would support um, my inclination is to stay with the nine. I just feel more comfortable having a broader representation of the com of the community on such an important committee. Thank you, George. So when you look at the applicants uh, at the current level and you look at where they live, you find out that um, maybe many of them come from say district, I won't name a number, but let's say, well, take my district, district three. So would you be okay with a body of nine people where say four of them come from the same district? Or would you expect that whether it's seven or nine, you want to see a pretty even spread? I think you probably would like to see a pretty even spread. So by keeping it at nine, you're going to make it a lot harder for us to get that kind of, of spread. Um, you're going to make it a lot harder for us to declare the pool sufficient. Um, now, my other members will vote and we'll make our decision. But I guess in a way, I'm asking you to help us get this body started by reducing the number to seven. You'll still get an excellent pool and it will be a diverse one. But if you keep it at nine, A, we're gonna still have the same problem of, of sufficiency and B, I'm not sure diversity is really gonna be helped all that much. Um, so I guess it's a cry for help, at least from one member of GOL. Andy. Yeah, I was just wondering if we could postpone this uh, vote until subsequent meeting simply because the League of Women Voters is having a, a session about the charter review. And in that process, it could be encouraging people who choose to attend to apply. And we may get a group of additional applicants as a result. And that's uh, now scheduled for this coming Sunday, April 7th. So uh, it doesn't seem like it's a big, uh, big delay, but it might give us more applications and may, might make us feel more comfortable with the nine. Lynn, may I? Yes, Anna. Um, Andy, I appreciate that. The reason why we I asked Lynn to put it on this agenda is one, the League of Women Voters already had their first uh, meeting of that series. I had I did reach out to them to ask them to promote this. Um, I do not have a way of knowing if if uh, CAFs correlate to that, but I was grateful if if they did share that um, we wanted people. I'm I am grateful to that. Um, and the reason why we wanted to do it at this meeting is that GOL is meeting on Thursday of this week, and we'd love to be able to take up the topic of the uh, sufficiency of the pool again. So um, hopefully that message was communicated at the at league's event on the 17th, and I know they have several more, but I would encourage us not to wait on this topic. I also just want a, a clarification. We can declare the pool sufficient but we can also still accept people. Is that correct? That's correct. We can accept new 
uh, CAFs up until the deadline for the statement of interest, they would just submit their CAF as well as their statement of interest. Thank you. I thought that was the part of the policy. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Walker. Um, that information changes a little bit what I was about to say, so bear with me. But um, I mean, I am in favor of staying with nine um, for a lot of the reasons why everyone else said, but I also think that this is like an incredibly significant group and that we should give them as much time as possible to be working on the things that they need to be working on. Um, and I do understand the concerns on the other side. And so I just, what my suggestion would be, and again, I know that this changes a bit with what um, Anna just let me know about allowing people to continue to submit applications until the statement of interest deadline. But I would say that like, I would encourage us to keep it at nine um, and then like set a date firm. Like we will go over this on this date. And is there any other way that we can spread massive awareness between now and whatever? Like, let's say we are going to readdress this at the GOL meeting next week. Um, can we do a press release and say like Amherst is looking for this? Like what other ways can we mass release information between now and next week where we can just move along with this? I don't know, but that would be my suggestion. Anna? Yeah, so this is something that also came out of the GOL meeting is that um, GOL is, is going to be reaching out to GOL, meaning me, I'm sorry, is going to be reaching out to Andy to hopefully have a discussion um, or hopefully prompt a discussion at TSO to talk about outreach for council appointed committees. This is something that uh, has been a, a big challenge for all of our council appointed committees, um, not just charter review. And so we want to have this larger conversation about outreach and how we're able to do that because Right now, the best mechanism we have is our own individual mailing lists, and uh, that's not going to bring in new folks and tends to be kind of a, can be a really limited pool. So um, I, that's not the direct answer to your question, but um, that's kind of the, the long-term hope is to improve our, our systems of outreach. Uh, I wanted to, to your initial point, GOL can keep, not finding the pool sufficient. Um, you know, I think that that's, there isn't necessarily a, a drop dead point. Um, this, this group does have a report due back to the council um, in 2025. They can request an extension as we see other committees do often on reports like this. Um, and then I think the only other thing I wanted to say is we keep, uh, folks keep framing this, this shift of seven to nine, which it's two people. To, to be very clear, I know I know that seems like a dramatic shift, but um, two people fewer as as a possibility that we're going to lose diversity on this committee. And I wanted to just raise the alternate possibility that having nine instead of seven might mean that there is more homogeny amongst the group, because when we look at the folks who have submitted CAFs, there's a lot of similarity. Um, and so I think as we as we think about seven, it's not it's not a guarantee that nine would be a more diverse representation of our community. Um, what determines that is our selection guidance, which is what um, GOL did set, and we are seeking diverse diversity in a number of dimensions. Um, that you're welcome to if you want to look back in our meeting folder. So I just, I did want to challenge a bit the assumption that nine would automatically be a more diverse pool based on the CAFs that we have so far. Thanks. Pat? Just a quick question. Is there any reason why we can't change the number, the number of members on the committee to be between seven and nine and then um, move ahead with the pool that we have and see what, who is on it? I don't think there's any reason you can do that. What you don't want is an even number. <laughs> uh, Alicia. Um, thank you, Anna. I appreciate that comment, but just in terms of diversity, my thought there, and that was one of my reasonings, and I can't remember if I explicitly listed it because I'm getting tired, but um, I prefer nine in terms of diversity because diversity of thought um, and less about like diversity demographically or like that, because 
no two people really think alike or have the same experience in this town. And also, this is a committee that I would assume is going to do a large amount of outreach or like communicating with the community. And we all have like different circles of people. And so I think just in terms of reaching more people in the town, having the nine in my opinion, is what I mean by like bringing more diversity to like the conversation that can happen in those groups. And I know two is not a large number, but it could make a huge difference. Like it also has that possibility on the other end. Anna? Yeah, and, and Alicia, my, that comment was not um, uh, directed at you specifically, just to be really, really clear. I think it, it, it could go either way on diversity of thought too. Um, and on networks too. And yes, everyone has a slightly different experience in this town, but one of the things that we are looking for in our selection guidance is that difference in in, in um, opinion and, and approach, right? And so I would encourage folks to read through that. It's something that the committee is taking really intentionally uh, into, into our process as we go through if we when we finally get to that stage. Um, but I think as with anything, it, it could go either way. I think for me, it's really about Nine is not a guarantee of anything and neither is seven. So the motion has been made and seconded. The motion is to amend the 2024 Charter Review Committee charge by striking nine in the number of voting members and replacing it with seven and striking nine residents in the composition se section and replacing it with seven residents. Seeing no other hands, I'm going to move to a vote. Bob Hegner. Yes. Councillor Lord. Um, Lord, no. Excuse me. Point, point of order. Yes. What are we actually voting on? Um, are we voting to reduce the number or are we voting on the slate, the current number? We're voting to reduce the number from nine to seven. Thank you for asking. Okay. Uh, Lord, that was a nay, correct? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Pam Rooney? No. Councilor Ryan? Yes. Kathy Shane? No. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? No. Councilor Walker? No. Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothner. Aye. Councilor Ette. No. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is a nay. Councilor Haneke. Aye. The motion fails um, with all 13 councilors voting. It is eight to five. Eight and eight, I'm sorry. Five in favor, eight against. Um, we, um, the hour is late, gang. And Anna, uh, I wanted to ask if you really do want to go ahead with liaisons or wait till next week. It's one, one week. Uh, nothing is prohibiting folks from from watching meetings that they uh, of committees that they care about. So I would encourage people if you are invested in a the work of a specific committee as an individual counselor, watch what they're doing, see see what's going on there. Um, and I'm happy at that point to wait until the next meeting to do formal assignments unless anyone else has an objection. Okay. Uh, committee reports, uh, Community Resources Committee, Pam Rooney. Thank you, you've heard a lot from us tonight, but uh, on March 12, CRC heard from the building commissioner on the proposed implementation plan, which you heard tonight. Um, a, a second item is a special meeting of the CRC will be on April 2, that will be tomorrow night, to interview our candidates for ZBA vacancies. And finally, that we, uh, CRC, sent the proposed nuisance bylaw update to the town manager for legal review and to GOL for its normal review. So we look forward to getting that back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, elementary School Building Committee, Kathy and Councilor Walker. Uh, the only thing I have to report, you already see, um, and a lot of you were there, we broke ground on the 
elementary school building project, but I, I know there there's going to be traffic changes and pickup changes and the website, I'll send this to everyone later again so you can look at it. It's amherst-school-project.com. We're putting up blurbs, news blurbs on a regular basis and a map. And this is going out to all the um, parents and students, but to the extent you get questions, and I'll just give everyone the link, that's gonna be updated on a regular basis as they um, change the traffic pattern on where cars come in and out and uh, next steps. So we're using that website. And there's a link to ARP at ARPS to the website too. So to the extent possible, um, people are being notified. Thank we, you. We don't have another meeting until a couple of weeks from now. Okay. Finance committee. Um, we have met several times since the last time I reported. Um, we have discussed and made recommendations on the $1.5 million debt authorization for the high school track and field and for the surplus property disposition policy. Um, I think they're still before the council. Um, we talked about the CPA recommendation today, and we've also started a discussion on the budget review process. Uh, tomorrow we're meeting, uh, we'll review the audit and begin review of the regional school budget and continue the process, the uh, review or the discussion on the budget review process. Thank you. Uh, GOL, Anna. GOL had um, worked through several different resolutions and proclamations, um, and we have several more coming, coming up on our list. Um, we are still seeking applicants for both Charter Review Committee, as you just heard, and Finance Committee. Uh, this is my desperate plea. If you voted no, please send me at least three CAFs in the next uh, couple of days for this for both of these committees because this is really this is getting really tough. Um, and if you look at the breakdown, y'all, it's we we need we need more folks. So please encourage um, encourage people to to submit uh, interest community action community activity forms. Excuse me. Um, we also begin our review process of the uh, town manager evaluation really starting just looking at our own process. Uh, at our coming meeting, each GOL member was assigned several other towns to look at their processes and see um, what works well, what doesn't work well, um, and what we might consider after the retreat. I think this is a really good um, exercise for GOL to go through and also start considering the um, impact that this has on the goals. So we're looking at other towns and bringing that back. We have several future agenda items, including the nuisance bylaw and the AHRA report that we are waiting to hear back from legal review on. We are not avoiding putting these on any agenda. We have not gotten them back from our legal team. So once we have them back, we will put them on an agenda and be able to um, move on those. But to, to date, I do not have them. So um, I, I have them from the, the uh, initial folks who created them, but I do not have them back from legal review. Um, GLL meets this week and, uh, we'll be continuing on, continuing on. Thank you. Uh, Jones Library, Pam Rooney, Paul Bachman. There have been no meetings. Okay. Uh, TSO, Andy Steinberg. What's something on library yet? Paul, library? I'm sorry, what? Did you have anything you wanted to just add on library? Um, so we have a new location for the term uh, subject to um, final negotiation of the lease, but we would need to get an RFP out there for moving services. And it's at 101 University Lane, University Drive, um, which is adjacent next to the post office to orient you. It's a great location, less than a mile from the current location on a bus route. Um, so three minute drive, 20 minute, 10 minute bus ride. So very good location. Thank you. Uh, TSO, Andy? Yeah, the TSO has had a number of meetings and rather than try and give a comprehensive report, now what I'm gonna do is never to get a written report into the packet for the next meeting. Okay. And uh, then um, we, I can answer any questions that come up there. The one thing that we did do that um, is, is a uh, uh, recommend recommendation back to the council so it needs to just move along at some point 
was the uh, approval of a proposal on North Pleasant Street for uh, modifications of uh, mostly sidewalks and bus stops, crosswalks. Um, and, uh, but um, as I say, we'll, uh, I'll endeavor to get a written report to you. Save time tonight. Thank you. Um, town manager's report, Paul. Yeah, just a couple things. Um, wanted to note that to, uh, tomorrow we have two meet and greets with the um, two finalists for the police chief, one at 5 p.m. Uh, with Todd Ahern and one at 6.30 with Gabriel Ting. Uh, they will also be here for most of the day interviewing with the search committee um, as they continue to have their deliberations. Um, and um, and with me, with me, with me, and with the HR director, uh, the um, Crest director has her first day on Monday, April eighth. Uh, we're planning a reception for her uh, when she gets her feet on the ground in the first week or two, as soon as we can get that arranged. And you have already noticed that the North Common has uh, is now under construction again. The, the contractor is eager to get that project up and running and finished. And we will, uh, they have a deadline of June 30th. So they're making really good progress. The one thing that you'll notice is that the bus stop that is a, in front of town hall is now gonna be moved down Main Street a little bit while they do that construction on that on that curbing, uh, then it'll be moved, relocated back to where it is. Okay, questions of the town manager. George Ryan. Bank Center, elevator. It's out of commission. Can, can you tell me the story? It's two months. Is that how it's going to be out for two months? Oh, I don't know what the exact okay. time frame is. Um, it's a long story. I can tell you. But <laughs> We've like. got time, Paul. So okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's it's been a uh, it's operational, but not um, passing inspection. And so there's some water in the pit that they won't pass inspection since they're, um, and we can get the water out, but they want us to get a waterproofing company come in and waterproof the pit. Um, and they're about a month away from being able to come in and do the waterproofing. It's very frustrating from our do, staff. I'm just, do we have a sense of how we kind of, the ball got dropped or was it just, we do for an inspection and that's what they found? Yes. That was it? Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. Are there any other questions or comments for the town manager? Okay. Uh, town Council comments, there's no president's report. I can tell you that I'm looking at what we've potentially scheduled for April 8th, and we're going to need to reduce it because it is just too much. And um, so, but I also want to make note that we have asked you to hold April 29th uh, for a council meeting. The idea might be that we'd be voting on the regional school budget at that time, but we may also shift some of these items to that night too. Um, the items that I'm looking at for April 8th, the possible items are, and this is not a promise, update on Hickory Ridge, two resolutions, um, Children's Mental Health Awareness Week and Day, uh, and Jewish Her American Heritage Month, uh, rent rental registration, Bylaw regulations and fee schedules, second reading and vote. Amherst College sign request, North Pleasant Street pedestrian improvements, Valley Bike, surplus property, um, planning board report on Amherst Hills, nuisance bylaw if ready. I think that would be enough to discourage most people. Um, are there any questions? Yes, George. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Andy. I just, uh, you you reminded me of something that was important that I should have said with TSO. TSO also voted to recommend the um, sign for, that was requested by Amherst College. Uh, and uh, since that's on next week's agenda, I thought I should add to my report of tonight just to say that that recommendation was made. Thank you. Uh, are there any other counselor comments or future agenda items? Seeing none, I'm making a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Change seconds. 
<laughs> okay. Um, we're moving to that vote, and the vote is um, uh, we have to do the vote, gang. Uh, Councilor Lord? Lord, I. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. Patty Angelos? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Councilor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmers? Aye. Councilor Hannick? Aye. Bob Hegner? Aye. It's unanimous. The meeting is adjourned. Good night, everyone.